What's up, guys? It's your boy, Omni Sensei. Welcome to What If I Was Reborn in Naruto as Shinobi with Gamer System. Part 8. Like, share, and comment on the video. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't subscribed. Also, remember to check out the original story. Link in the description. With all that out of the way, let's get into it. His grind list was never ending. It seemed that every single time Daiki managed to whittle down his list to nothing, more popped up for him to get right back on the saddle and get back to it. It sure is great to be me. Daiki whistled a jaunty tune as he made his way back towards his home, taking a leisurely stroll through the village streets for once instead of blitzing across the rooftops. It was nice to take it slow now and then, before returning to going fast. Though he was also a little amused. Thanks to Isabu's memories of Yagura's training and the scrolls he just got from the old man, there was a good chance he was going to master every other element first before his natural lightning affinity. Granted, thanks to one of the jutsu the old man taught him during their training, he had a great idea on how to go about mastering it. And even if it didn't, it would be a step towards creating his very own S-rank jutsu. Even if he was copying Sasuke at the brass tacks of it. It was fine though, he'd never know. I suppose since the old man showed me them, it'll make for a good excuse to learn the Chidori and Raisingan. He mused. While he didn't know the instructions for learning the Chidori, he already had a rough idea of how it worked thanks to his eyes when he saw the old man perform it. Hmm, he supposed he could also see about learning Shadow of the Dancing Leaf as well. He'd seen multiple uses of it already since the beginning of the Chunin exams. Speaking of Lee, Daiki stopped in his tracks, a frown splaying across his lip. Perhaps he should go see him before he left the village for his mission. Angry as he was at him for being a fool, he still couldn't help but feel for him. Once upon a time, Rock Lee and his never-give-up attitude had been someone he looked up to. Between him and Naruto, his love of the grind had taken shape and inspiration from them, had been what got him going to the gym in his old life. The anger he'd felt over his foolishness, and still did even, did not outweigh the good things for him in the end. Suffice to say, Daiki decided to make his way towards the hospital before heading home and pay Rock Lee a visit. But as he approached the hospital, something stood out. Or rather, someone. They were a block away from the hospital, atop a large building overlooking the hospital, and so well hidden that most wouldn't even notice them. But there was no hiding from the scarlet eye. Not unless you were behind some crazy Uzumaki seals designed to block out even the Byakugan at least. It was a familiar short redhead with a gourd atop his back, standing in the building and looking directly at the hospital, arms crossed, a frown on his face. His gaze was intense, teal eyes filled with a hunger for blood. Oh right, Gara was obsessed with killing Lee for a bit, because Guy stopped him during the exams. Wasn't he? Daiki mused. Now what to do about that? Should he confront him, or let things play out? Actually, if he remembered right, Gara almost did manage to assassinate Lee, and was only foiled luckily by Naruto and Shikamaru, before Guy turned up to stop Gara from killing those two. The question was if Guy was actually there all the time and ready to step in at a moment's notice, or not. Daiki wanted to believe he was, since letting a foreign shinobi get into the hospital so easily was the height of incompetence. And that was just silly considering there was an entire barrier over the village with the barrier team monitoring the village 24-7. While it was impossible for them to scrutinize every little thing, they for sure would have around-the-clock surveillance on a foreign Jinchuriki. Actually, weird. Naruto knew about Gara being a Jinchuriki. He wasn't supposed to learn that until Gara tried to kill Lee which was the literal day before the third round. Has it already happened? Daiki wondered. If it did though, why was Gara still obsessing over Lee? Well, either way, letting things play out at this point wouldn't give him the same results so he may as well confront the other Jinchuriki. Sighing in annoyance, Daiki hopped up onto the roofs and made his way over towards Gara, not bothering to hide his presence. Gara's eyes roamed from the hospital building and landed on Daiki as he landed on the roof. As he did, 
Daiki noticed, the whites of his eyes were bloodshot. You! Gara all but growled, black ringed eyes narrowing at him and a spike of killing intent rising in the air. The redhead's bloodlust hung heavily in the air. Sup, raccoon boy? Daiki greeted him with a smirk. You shouldn't be here. He added, his hands casually resting in his pockets. A simple glance out of the side of his eye was enough to confirm his previous thoughts were right. With his telescopic vision that could see clearly up to ten miles away, he could spot Rock Lee in his hospital room. Doing one-handed handstand push-ups, Daiki resisted the urge to sigh. As much as he respected the hell out of grinding like that even in his state, he was just doing more damage to himself like that. You are the one who threatened my existence before, after boasting of how you could defeat all the trash alongside me. Gara's gaze and bloodlust sharpened noticeably. That I am, Daiki nodded. Sorry about that. I was in a bit of a bad mood, you see. A friend of mine, the guy you fought, crippled himself just to try and beat a weakling like you. So it pissed me off a bit. If possible, the bloodlust in the air spiked, anger filling it and within all the time it took to blink. A large spear of sand shot through the air towards him, erupting from Gara's back. It didn't even make contact, the sand falling to the ground harmlessly as his armor sucked the chakra out of it. Having performance issues? Daiki taunted with a smirk. Humph, absorbing chakra. How quaint. Gara scoffed. Yet despite his words, his bloodlust did not lessen. I will kill you regardless of your little tricks. Tricks are for kids, Daiki snorted. And it's impossible for you to kill me. You're just a failure of a Jinchuriki after all, not like me. I'm better than you in every single way. Gara's gaze tightened. Do not speak, as if you know me, just because you know what I am. He bit out, lifting his hands. You are just a mere human. I am the demon of the sand. He raised both hands up, his chakra spiking and sand erupted from the gourd on his back, swelling up into the air above them. But with how blatant his bloodlust was, it was easy to predict such an action, especially with Gara's prior track record. That was why, the split moments his chakra spiked, Lightning sparked into existence around Daiki's body and he moved. Gara's sand jumped to his defense. It was not fast enough. With the lightning chakra mode, his speed was well a match for Rock Lee when he was using the gates. If not faster, Gara only had time for his eyes to widen in shock, before Daiki's palm smashed into his face and bodily lifted him up into the air, before slamming him back down onto the rooftop. Only then did the sand reach him, Switching from defense to offense, tens of dozens of sand spikes aiming to impale him from every angle. But just like before, the second they got within the vicinity of his body, they shriveled away as the chakra was absorbed from them. Gara's eyes were wide with horror and fear. And oh? The boy snarled around the palm in his face and clenched his fists. The sand that had been scattered, filling with chakra once more and leaping to his aid. Stop, or I'll kill you. Daiki said simply, and it halted. It was not a threat in his voice. It was a promise. And Gara froze. That was Gara's biggest problem, really. At this point in time, without relying on the strength of the one tail, he was powerless. And against someone that knew his weaknesses like him and could exploit them, he was a sitting duck. The turtle-shaped pauldron atop his shoulder had been specifically created to counter Gara. And that was not taking into account his armor, the seal on his palm that could absorb chakra and the jutsu he'd stolen for himself that let him absorb chakra. He literally had four different methods of absorbing chakra and rendering Gara's greatest weapon and defense useless before him. Quite simply, Daiki was Gara's worst possible matchup. And unless he unleashed Shikaku, there was nothing he could do against him. Just as I told your sister, you really are a failure of a Jinchuriki. Daiki shook his head. It's sad, really. The second I invalidate your sand, you're literally nothing. Without your sand, your average genin could kick your butt around. You! Gara trailed off, just staring up at him. I, I will not let you steal my existence. I don't want it. I wouldn't even be bothering with you if you weren't obsessing over killing a friend of mine. Daiki replied with a snort. All you are, is a failure of a Jinchuriki that's too lonely and hurt to pull yourself out of your self-pity. 
this was a bit of a delicate situation. As such, he handled it with all the grace of a bull in a china shop. As he always did. I'm not lonely. Gara all but snarled. The emotionless facade he liked to portray nowhere in sight. You know nothing. I know everything. Daiki countered with a smirk, allowing the lightning armor to fade from around his body. And he felt a great relief as he did. The damage it had done to his body already beginning to heal. After all, unlike you, I'm perfect. He boasted and reached deep within and pulled. Sizzling red chakra exploded into existence around his form in place of the lightning armor. Three tails lazily swinging in the air behind him. You! Gara's eyes widened in shock. You're just like me? You're a demon as well? No, I'm a Jinchuriki. We're Jinchuriki. Daiki corrected, then shook his head. What the hell is up with everyone thinking the Bijou are demons? Demons are pussy-ass weaklings compared to them. Why the hell would you boast about being a weakling like that? Say it with me, Gara. We're Jinchuriki. We're way scarier than any pansy demon. Honestly, it was getting almost insulting at this point. A different name changes nothing. I am treated as a demon. Thus I am, Gara replied. We are demons to the world. A world that will shun us and try to steal our very lives. I will not let my existence be snuffed. Daiki rolled his eyes, letting go of Gara's face and stepping back. Your dad really did you dirty, huh? He shook his head. About as expected. The man is a complete clown after all. As I already told your sister, Gara stared up into the sky, confused. Why did you let me go? He asked, instead of commenting on what he said about Raza the Clown Kage. Why not? Like I told you, you're no threat to me. Daiki replied, then sighed. Honestly, at most I'm disappointed in how weak you are. We Jinchuriki are superior to normal ninja, but you've done it wrong. You can't control Shikaku at all and rely on its power over using it to bolster your own. You might have the weakest of the Bijou, but that doesn't mean you should be a weakling. Gara winced at his words, clutching at his head and grimaced noticeably. Guess he didn't like my words, huh? Daiki smirked, then held up a single hand, chakra glowing along his fingertips. Shut the hell up, Shikaku, or I'll seal you off entirely. We're having a conversation here. He threatened. Gara winced again, before his expression eased up. For all Shikaku played up the insane act, it was just that, an act. And it knew better than to risk its influence over its host. You, you made mother quiet? Gara gave him a gobsmacked look. I could make Shikaku quiet forever if you want, Daiki offered, despite himself. Even with his disappointment in Gara's strength, it didn't change the guy was done dirty and couldn't even sleep because of Shikaku. That was bound to give anyone a few screws loose. And Shikaku's not your mother. Your mother is dead. She died bringing you into this world. So don't disrespect her like that. Gara looked as if Daiki just slapped him. Which technically, he kind of did not long just, just with his full palm. Daiki sighed. Look, I get it. Your life sucks and has sucked for a long time. Your mom died giving birth to you. Your dad stuck a bijou in you that you never wanted. He forced your siblings not to interact with you. Tried to have you killed a bunch of times and everyone avoided you thinking you were a demon. He rattled off and actually found himself wincing as he spoke it aloud. Pity for the other boy welling up in him. It must have been lonely and hard. What, how do you? Gara's voice came out in a whisper. Everyone in your village knows what happened to you basically. So anyone outside the village can get the information easily from their loose lips. Daiki responded then crouched down to be eye level with the boy who had been too caught in the discussion to stand back up. But see, despite your deadbeat dad, you're not actually alone. You still have siblings who love you, for all that they're absolutely terrified of you at the same time. Lies, those weaklings hate me. Gara responded instantly. No, they don't, Daiki flatly replied. At the very least, Tamari doesn't hate you. If she hated you, she wouldn't have turned up at my room to scope me out and make threats after the first second round of the exams. Well, he was embellishing a little. But he did know for a fact Tamari loved her little brother and would give her life for him even now. A weakling like Tamari? Threatened you? Gara's head tilted to the side, and he asked in a small voice. But, you're so strong and powerful. 
You defeated me with ease and my sister is a gnat compared to me. Like I said, just because she's scared of you because you always threaten to kill her, doesn't mean she doesn't love you? Daiki replied and leaned forward, laying his hand on the boy's shoulder. I mean, think back. Has there even been a time where your siblings treated you badly even before you went psycho murderer? Or was it all your father forcing them? Gara looked away, unable to meet his eyes. For what it's worth, there's nothing wrong with hating the people who made your life hell, Daiki said in consolation. But blaming those who didn't is just doing the same thing others did to you, and you clearly don't like it. Honestly, while I can't understand things from your view, since I willingly became a Jinchuriki, I sympathize with you. And really, if you want to talk to someone about it, you should go find Naruto because he was treated a lot like you growing up. The blonde boy, Gara's non-existent eyebrows furrowed. The one who said he has a demon? A bijou as well? Hmm, so that did happen. Yup, and he's a whiny mess over it just like you, Daiki snorted. I'll tell you the same thing I told him when I was teaching him how to use his power not long ago. Be proud of who and what you are. You should be. Being a Jinchuriki makes you inherently superior to normal ninja from the get-go. And if you are proud of it and wear like an armor, it can never be used to hurt you. Don't brandish it like a sword. Gara did not reply, but a storm of emotion swirled in his teal eyes. Go home, Gara. Spend some time with your siblings while you're away from your father, and for once in your life, make your own decisions. Daiki finished, standing back up. As he did, Gara slowly did so as well. I need to think, he said, before bringing his hands up into a single hand seal and disappearing in a swirl of sand. As he left, Daiki rubbed his head and sighed in annoyance. What the hell am I? The Jinchuriki therapist, he groaned. He could only hope Gara did take his words to heart. Because Naruto was far stronger than he was in the other timeline right now and could freely use the one-tailed cloak thanks to him. Gara might just die if they fought this time around. And even if they didn't, Daiki wouldn't be able to pull his punches the next time around. Because he'd be slaughtering his way through every single invader that he saw during the invasion. Daiki stared at the spot where the one-tailed Jinchuriki had been standing in before he departed for a few moments. Hopefully that didn't come back to bite him in the butt. Why can't they just be like Fu? He groaned inwardly. Besides himself and Killer B, she was the most well-adjusted Jinchuriki by far, having none of the hang-ups and angst Naruto, Gara, and the like had. Actually, considering Killer B's obsession with rap and his own everything, Fu was probably the most well-adjusted Jinchuriki of all now that she had gotten a little bit of freedom from her village with the Shadow Clone Jutsu he taught her. Lucky number seven, indeed. Isabu piped in, how envious to have a host that isn't a complete basket case. While I get stuck with you. Shut up, bitch, you love it? Daiki snorted back. Besides, you can leave at any time, remember? After I've finally managed to bring your pitiful chakra reserves up to a level where I can comfortably submerge in them and got my pond built the way I like it? Isabu snorted right back at him in return. Fat chance, this is my house now, kid. Ride or die, I go down with my ships like a true captain. You get me? Daiki's gaze turned dry and he said nothing in response. In his mind's eye, he saw Isabu shrug unashamedly. Bijou get bored too, you know. And I can see your memories better even than you can. He defended himself. Fair enough. Rolling his eyes, Daiki turned around and paused. Speaking of basket cases that need to become well-adjusted people. He mused to himself and looked directly at Rock Lee, still training himself. With his eyesight he could see the way his body shook, how sweat formed in his pores and dripped out from his face onto the tiled floor of the hospital, and how his arm and leg, both in a thick casting while they healed from being crushed by Gara's sand, trembled with pain. He should leave. He should walk away and leave the idiot that couldn't take a moment to rub two brain cells together even after being given advice to save his life and spare himself a useless, fruitless fight. But you won't, Isobu Muset. Damn you, Rockley. Daiki ground his teeth together and moved, disappearing in a blur of speed. He touched down a blink later, atop the ledge of the open window, not a sound being made from his feet as he landed. Rockley, face angled towards the ground, did not react and continued his way through a struggling one-handed vertical push-up. 1,830, 
7. He really needed to work on his sensory abilities. And that was coming from him, the laughing stock of the Chameleon Clan for his atrocious sensory abilities in comparison to them. You really can't help yourself, huh? Daiki commented after he finished the push-up. Lee flinched and gave a cry of surprise, tipping forward in his surprise and would have smashed his back into the wall if not for Daiki putting his hand out and stopping him, holding him in place. D. Daiki Kuen? Lee, exhaustion evident on his face and slick with sweat, tilted his head back to look up at him from below. That's the name. Don't wear it out be dash. He stopped himself before he called the older bud. He was mad at him after all. So what's this then? Shouldn't you be resting? I, I cannot. Lee shook his head. The longer I lay around, the further behind I fall. Daiki shook his head. This would just make things worse. You can't train your other side after all. You'll be lopsided, he pointed out. Not that it matters, your career as a shinobi is over. Lee's eyes widened and his whole body stilled. His face scrunching up with something close to despair and only barely stopping from reaching that tipping point by sheer will. The boy did not want to show such a thing to him after all. Daiki didn't blame him for that. He would be the same, his pride could never allow it. You found out? Lee asked, a tremble shaking his body that was not at all related to the training he had been forcing himself through. I knew before anybody, Daiki told, leveling him with a serious gaze. With these eyes, I could literally see your bones breaking down the second things went serious. Ah, yes. Lee trailed off and ducked his head down to avoid his scarlet gaze. Garrison truly was not merciful at all. You did this to yourself, Daiki replied bluntly and without any mercy. He wasn't going to let him evade. You were stupid, ignorant, arrogant, and did I mention stupid? Because you were stupid. Just thinking about it again was riling him up the point where his vocabulary was failing him. He saw Lee's hand below clench into a fist atop the tile. But Daiki wasn't about to stop right now. Otherwise he'd just repeat the same mistake in the future without learning anything. Sure, Gara crushed your arm and leg into paste. But given enough time, with help from Medic Ninja, they'd heal, he continued. The real problem is what you did to yourself. You weren't ready for the gates, your body wasn't strong enough. And the strain of the gates cracked your entirely skeletal structure, including your spine. You have fragments of bone across your entire body, and most importantly, a bunch of it lodged in your spine. We don't have a single medical ninja capable of fixing you. Even Tsunade herself, the greatest medical jutsu user in the world, couldn't fix you without you dying on the operating table. OSP. He heard a bear whisper come from Lee below him. Stop! Please, Daiki Kuen. The older boy looked back up at him, his resolve and brave face having faded away and in its place were tears. The words he wanted to say were lodged in his throat. In response to the boy's tears, he couldn't bring himself to continue lambasting him. I know. I know, it's all my fault. I know I was stupid, Daiki Kuen. The boy cried out in despair. But if I gave up, if I retreated, I would have lost something important. How could I continue to believe I could be a splendid shinobi using only taijutsu if I bowed then? Daiki sighed. You were already a splendid shinobi. W what? Lee's crying sobs stopped abruptly. But the tears didn't stop flowing as he stared at the younger boy. Gobsmacked. You were... Daiki shrugged and admitted. Despite your lack of talent, you kept on going. You worked hard. You put yourself and your body through hell and dedicated everything to the grind and getting strong enough to become a splendid shinobi. And you became one. Being a splendid shinobi doesn't mean you have to be the strongest. The fact you're only 16 and could beat tons of jonin in a straight-up taijutsu battle shows how hard you worked. But you threw that away, Lee. I threw it away, he whispered, struck. The strength in his arm gave out and he almost fell directly down. Daiki caught him by the back of his shirt and threw him up, spinning the boy through the air, orienting him around and catching him by the collar a second later, holding him aloft in the air so he could stare directly into his eyes. You are a shinobi of Kanoha. Promoting the interests of the village and protecting the village, you were already on that path, and you were already on the path to becoming a powerhouse like Guy, he told him. But you threw that away for a pissing contest. 
You turned your back on your dream of being a splendid shinobi, to feel strong and impress everyone watching. Nothing more, nothing less. I, I just wanted to show that I could do it, that I deserved to be there, that I was strong too. Lee bit his lip and did not resist, just hung there in his grasp. The defeat radiating from his form was palpable. To who? Guy? He already knows how strong you are? Sakura, because you took a liking to her? She already knows how strong you are as well. You showed her after all. Me? The Hokage? No, we both know you deserve to be there. Daiki replied, eyes narrowing. No, it was about none us. Well, maybe a bit of you wanting to show off to Sakura, I mean, who doesn't like to show off for the girls? No, in the end, you did it all to show off to Niji, your big-time rival. You wanted validation from him. He got right to the true meat of the issue. Lee said nothing, but the way his face scrunched up and he looked away, told him all he needed to hear. You wanted to prove that hard work can surpass a genius innate talent. The problem being, you seem to be under the impression that these genius don't work had too. He told him straight up. I respect your dedication to the grind, Lee. Nobody in this village gets it like you and Guy do. But do you think you're the only ones that work hard? Do you think you're the only ones that suffer with not being talented at everything? Here's a newsflash for you, Lee, you're not. But you overcame that, at least physically. Suffering and disappointment aren't enough, Lee. You can't just be strong, you have to be smart, you can't just hope others will think you deserve it, you have to make yourself worthy and full-heartedly believe in it. But all you could think about in that moment, even though your future was as vast and as wide as the planet itself, was proving a point to a jackass that believes in nothing but an arbitrary predestined fate and put everything, your life, your effort, your dreams, the bitter tears you cried and used as motivation, on the line. He got so worked up, that by the end, Daiki actually found himself panting as if he'd sprinted through the night and traversed hundreds of miles. For a few moments, there was silence in the hospital room, only interrupted at all by Daiki's panting. It didn't take long for him to get himself back under control, a sigh leaving him as he did. Sorry, he apologized with a grimace, realizing he'd let his emotions get the better of him again. I'm just angry at you for doing this to yourself. No, it's okay. Lee sniffed, shaking his head as he turned back around to look Daiki in the face, giving him a watery smile. You are right after all, Daiki Kuen. I was stupid, I did not think things through. Harsh as you were, I am happy to have heard them. It means a lot to me that you thought I was a splendid shinobi in the end. Even if I can no long dash. Yeah, I'm gonna cut you off there, bud. Daiki sighed. This isn't the end for your dreams yet. Ah. Rock Lee gave him a confused look. Daiki said nothing in response and instead, drew upon some of the stored chakra within his heavenly star seal and made a single hand seal. The hand holding Lee lit up with a soft green aura that turned into a shimmering white as he directed the stored chakra into it with his eyes and amplified it. Ah! Lee's eyes widened as the white aura spread from Daiki's hand until it covered his whole body. The bowl-cut-haired boy looking to his arm in the cast in something akin to awe. The pain? It's fading away? Within moments, it was done and Daiki lowered the boy he was holding up to the ground. His feet, one in a massive cast just like his arm touched the ground, and beyond hunching over slightly because of the bone fragments lodged in his spine, he stayed on his feet. My leg and arm? You healed them? Lee stared at him, mouth agape. I healed everything I could. Daiki nodded, it had taken a not-so-small chunk of the stored chakra to do so, but it was not all that much in the grand scheme of things, conversion-wise, about a year or so of life force. I can't do anything about the fragments of bone in you. If I could, I would have already. Yes, I suppose you would. You are kind after all, Daiki Kuin, Lee replied, hiding the disappointment. Even if I cannot continue the path of being a shinobi, this act and your words mean a lot to me. Look, I know this will sound weird after everything I just said, but you'll be a shinobi again, I promise, Daiki declared. I don't have the skill to heal you fully, and Tsunade doesn't have the ability to keep you alive without a doubt during a surgery, not to mention she isn't even in the village anymore. But, I'll get her back here to fix you up, and I'll use my jutsu to keep you alive and make sure you don't die in the process. He promised. Daiki Kuin? Rock Lee's eyes filled with tears, 
and the boy spread his arms wide, cast in all and absolutely bald as he hugged Daiki. Daiki grimaced at the contact, but did let him cry it out. There, there, he awkwardly pat him on the back. In the end, Lee outright ended up crying himself to sleep in Daiki's arms. Despite the brave face he'd put on and how he tried to shoulder on regardless, it really truly had been weighing on the older boy's mind heavily. And Daiki would not hold it against him. Despite his unfortunate position being all his own fault and the height of stupidity, the dam had simply broken when Daiki made his promise to heal the older boy and the emotions he'd been holding back had surged out all at once and overwhelmed him. Once he'd conked out, Daiki had simply put him back into his bed and left via the window he'd entered, which led him to now, walking through the streets of Kanoha, back towards his home. The question is, how the hell do I deliver on that promise now? He mused. He really did have a bad habit of talking big without being 100% capable of backing it up. Sure, he could deliver on his half of things and keep Lee alive during the operation to remove the bone shards from his spine, and even fix it up good and proper afterwards so he didn't even need to go through a long recovery time like he did in the other timeline. The problem was, how the hell am I going to convince Tsunade to come back here? He wondered. He highly doubted she'd return over a threat of being branded a Nukneen. Nor would he go that far anyway. Tsunade was the greatest medical ninja in the entire world, the strongest woman in the world barring Kagaya who didn't really count, and a high-tier S-class combatant. Turning her against the village was stupidity and he needed all the help he could get in the future. Maybe, Naruto? He wondered, cupping his chin. It had worked in the other timeline, but there were extenuating circumstances that allowed him to bring her back in that world. He couldn't be sure at all that would work here. Especially since, if he had his way, Orochimaru wasn't going to be walking away after the invasion with something as little as two soul-munched arms. For one, he wasn't going to let the old man get to the point where he'd have to use the Reaper Death Seal. Even if he had to trap Orochimaru in the four Red Yang formation and spam Bijidama after Bijidama until he was sure he erased the Snake Man from existence. Old man Saratobi might not have wanted to get his youth back, but Daiki for sure wasn't going to let him croak that easily. Oh also, note to self, check out the Uzumaki Mask Temple and release Minato's soul from the Shinigami's stomach. He paused as he remembered. Though that of course would have to wait until after the invasion. So he didn't need to worry about Mr. Flash by grinding his innards to pulp with a raisin gun. Daiki! A familiar voice calling his name broke him from his thoughts. And the muscular looked over his shoulder to find a familiar pink-haired, green-eyed girl jogging up to him. Yo! He greeted Sakura as she reached him. What's up green-eyed lady? Is that a jealousy quip? Was the first thing she asked giving him a frown and searching look. No, Daiki tilted his head to the side, confused him. Why are you jealous of something I should know about? You just have green eyes. Don't tell me you forgot about that. Oh, Sakura blinked and then laughed. It's just you have this habit of making stupid quips and little digs like that, especially when you're around Kakashi-sensei, so I thought you were being you know you. I am so not that bad, he denied. You kinda are. You kinda are. Both Sakura and Isabu replied at the same time. Damn, was he? He coughed. Fine, whatever. I wasn't doing it now, though. He waved it off. So, what's up? I should be asking you that. Sakura rolled those emerald greens of hers. I've not seen you since the end of the preliminaries. Honestly, I've not seen Naruto or Sasuke Kuin or Kakashi Sensei either. I mean, I know they're training, but I kind of expected to see them around, you know? I was on my way to visit Lee when I saw you jumping out of his window, so I decided to catch you. Seriously, Kakashi? Daiki deadpanned inwardly. Did that idiot seriously disappear on the girl and leave her with nothing to do? Sure, she wasn't in the final rounds, but come on. It was literally a full month where she was left with nothing to do. Not even missions since she was allowed to take any herself yet being a Kunoichi under Kakashi's command. What if she was an orphan like him? How was she supposed to make ends meet to get by? That dude needed a kick up the rear. Sasuke and Kakashi are up in the mountains behind the training grounds. He replied out loud with. At least that was where he remembered they were training. He then turned, eyes searching and pointed in the direction of where he left a certain busta blonde. Naruto is somewhere around, there. Sakura blinked. How'd you know that? 
she wondered. Daiki grinned, pointing at his eyes. These eyes, baby. Amongst other things like seeing chakra and through solid objects and such, I can also see up to ten miles away. Oh! She made a small O shape with her mouth, before stepping forward to look deeper into their eyes. They're pretty, kind of like Sasuke Kuen's Sharingan, but a gentler color and doesn't have the little comma things. And actually, I was meaning to ask about them, how did you get them? Are you from a clan or something I don't know about? Do you have a bloodline? No, he, actually, you kind of do. Isabu interrupted him before he could get to replying. Putting aside the status screen of yours, which I can't confirm is one or not, you do have abilities that will pass on through your blood. For one, your chakra is naturally much more potent, not just from my influence, but because of multiple different chakras in your heavenly star seal. Not to mention, my coral style are full on a part of you now, even if I was taken out of you, you'd still have it. I'm fairly certain that will pass on to your children as well. Ah. Cool. Daiki grinned, filing that tidbit away for later. Well, I'm not part of a clan, but I do have a bloodline. These eyes aren't part of it, though. I killed a guy with these out on a mission and took them for myself. You mean, those aren't your own eyes? Sakura gave him an odd look. Yup, Daiki confirmed with a nod, shamelessly. Plucked them right out of his skull, and then used the mystical palm jutsu to implant them in my own after plucking my own out. E.W.? Sakura wrinkled her nose in disgust. You seriously plucked out your own eyes to implant the eyes of someone you killed? I mean, when you say it like that, you make it sound like a bad thing, Daiki pointed out before adding. Besides, I don't see you saying anything about Kakashi running around with another dude's Sharingan in one of his eye sockets. Kakashi-sensei doesn't brag about murdering someone and stealing their eyes. Sakura deadpanned back. What can I say? I'm just built different from that scrub. Daiki gave her a devious grin. Besides, it was hardly murder. He was part of a duo that was enslaving and murdering civilians for kicks. Saying it like that and telling himself that helped him sleep better at night. Not that he actually needed all that much sleep now. But still. It's still gross though. Sakura shook her head. Anyway. Now that you've brought it up again. I was wondering if you could maybe give me some pointers on learning the mystical palm jutsu? Hmm. Right she had shown an interest in it hadn't she? Sure. Daiki shrugged. The quicker he got her started on things. The stronger she'd become in the future. It'll have to be now though. I'm heading out for a mission first thing tomorrow morning. Okay, that should be. Sakura began replying only to pause. A mission? Now? With the third round coming up? Where to? Yup, and the Mist Village. Daiki nodded, confirming. The Mist Village, now? Why are they sending a gen in there? And will you even be back in time? Sakura gaped at him. He noticed quite a few people stopping to stare because of how loud her voice got there. So he put his hand on her shoulder. Let's take this somewhere a bit more private. All right. Sakura agreed and he made a single hand sign before disappearing in a blur with a body flicker, taking the girl along with him. They appeared not long later at his home away from home, the origin and birthplace of the one true grind. Training ground 69. The body flicker sure is handy, Sakura mused. Do you think you could teach me it as well? Shouldn't be too hard. Daiki shrugged. Though it won't be much help in a fight for you. Without the Sharingan or reflexes of the Yandame Hokage, the tunnel vision will be a killer. Ah, uh, still, it's pretty good for getting around. Sakura hummed and followed him into the training ground. She paused though at the sign designating the training ground number. You know, now that I know what you're like, I'm not at all surprised you chose this training ground. She looked over her shoulder at him to give him a deadpan look. He smirked and looked down, staring blatantly at her wagon stretching out those skin-tight spats of hers. Sakura snorted and gave him a dry look. Yeah, that's about right. She nodded and continued on, making her way into the actual training ground. This time, though, there was a definite wiggle in her walk. So, what's the deal with your mission? Why do you have to bring me here to talk about it? Peeling his eyes off of her rear, Daiki shrugged. Well... We needed to come to a training ground anyway for me to teach you, he replied. That is unless you want to use the training spot I have at my place, Sakura snorted. No, I know better than to go home with you, she turned to him. I get a feeling there would be a whole lot less training going on there, 
Not really, he shrugged. I might push things a bit, but you already know I'm not going to force anything. Sakura grinned at him. Who said anything about you forcing it? She teased, making him blink at the implications. So, mission, I'll be gone for at least a week. Maybe two, Daiki shrugged. I'm heading there to open up talks about the hidden mist village allying with us. You what? Sakura goggled. Why are they sending you? You're just a genin. Sure, in a completely different league from the rest of us genin. But shouldn't a higher up be doing this kind of thing? I am a higher up, Daiki shrugged, feeling no need to hide it. I mean, it was already pretty blatant I'm just in the Chunin exams for us to show off, right? You did mention something like that. Sakura's brows furrowed. So does that mean you've already been picked to be promoted to Chunin after the exams? Jonin actually. He corrected her. Her eyes widened. A Jonin like Kakashi Sensei? She gasped. Something like that. Daiki confirmed with a nod. Not to mention, I'm next in line to be Hokage. Sakura blinked before bursting out laughing. Ha 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 ha. Great peals of amusement erupted from her lips and lasted a good 20 or so seconds before she managed to manage it down to just some small chuckles, wiping a tear of amusement from my... Oh, that was a good one. You as Hokage. In response, Daiki said nothing, merely smiling at her, not at all bothered. Slowly, the grin on her lips dropped and her eyes widened as realization set in. As always, she was quick on the uptake and his lack of reply said more than enough to her. Oh God, you weren't kidding. She gaped, staring at him in almost horror. You as the Hokage how? Should I be insulted that nobody believes me at first when I tell them this? Daiki wondered. Tenten, Naruto, and now Sakura. Sure, they were all of his generation and were pretty ignorant of how things actually worked unlike him, but still. Well, Sakura caught on quickly to it not being a lie at least. Because I'm strong, and that's the main requirement of being Hokage? Daiki shrugged. While not as strong as Kakashi even when using the seal I got from Orochimaru and improved upon to make it better. I've got another power that makes me the strongest guy in this village besides the Hokage himself. Another power? Sakura trailed off before her eyes lit up suddenly. Is it something to do with the hero water? You drank that before when we went to the waterfall village and you like powered up massively from it for a bit and absolutely crushed that guy that took me hostage. Can you use that on the fly or something now? No, good try though, Daiki laughed. It's something that needs to be kept secret for now, Hokage's law and all, and it's not really my power so much as a power I can borrow. And that's who I've been with for the last while actually, I was getting personal training from the old man. Training with the Hokage himself, huh? That must have been amazing, Sakura gasped in awe, before swallowing and shaking her head. But you as the Hokage, huh? I can only imagine the kind of stupid laws you would pass. He he. Daiki thumbed his nose. The first one I'm passing is that all hot kunoichi, like you for instance, are required to wear tiny mini skirts, he proclaimed proudly, punching his fist into the air grandly. Of course it is. Sakura gave him a dry look. Better get shopping for some nice mini skirts for the future. He taunted her with a laugh. Sakura in return merely shrugged. I'm good. I already own plenty. Daiki crossed his arms and raised an eyebrow at her challengingly. But are they pleated? More than half of them. Sakura shrugged and then laughed lightly. Really not hiding your tastes at all here. Good girl. Being prepared and ahead of the game. That's a true kunoichi right there. Daiki praised her. You know that's the first time since I graduated the academy somebody has called me a good kunoichi? Well, beyond Lee and Naruto, Sakura cocked her head thoughtfully. And it's because I own some small skirts. And it came from the future Hokage himself. Aren't you special? Daiki grinned at her. Yay? She replied dully. This is truly going to be the highlight of my career as a kunoichi. He laughed. Good to see how much my opinion means to you, he shot back. But, while we're on the topic and getting around to training, what actually is your plan with your career? What are you aiming for here? Well, besides wanting to ride Sasuke until his bed breaks. Sakura bit her lip. To be honest, I don't know anymore. The forest of death was a real wake-up call for me. 
she replied, and then raised both eyebrows at him. And should the future Hokage really talk like that? Besides, you already know, I decided to let that go. I've already learned how shallow my feelings were. Fair enough. There's plenty of time to think of what you want to aim for, to be honest. It doesn't even have to be anything grand. You can just want to be a strong, well-earning Kunoichi and live a good life, Daiki replied, nodding his head. And I can stop if you want. I'm just having a laugh. He offered no. It's all right. She huffed a bit through her nose, a small half-smile splaying across her face. I've gotten used to it now, and I kind of like how upfront and honest you are about everything. It's a far cry from Naruto just telling me what I want to hear and Sasuke barely ever opening his mouth when I talk to him. Well, fair enough. He could see how that would be a refreshing change of pace. And it was always nice to see where you stood with people. And you like me complimenting you. He pointed and added. Maybe a bit. Sakura shrugged, unforthcoming. But her pretty green eyes glittered with happiness and gave her away regardless. All right then, fat rear. And that's with a page and not an F. Daiki clapped his hands together. Let's get down to training, shall we? Still not charming to say that, by the way, even if you change the spelling. Sakura told him, but nodded in agreement nonetheless. Perhaps, unsurprisingly, it didn't take Sakura very long at all to understand and get the basics down of the mystical palm jutsu. She easily understood the concept behind it. It only had one hand seal to remember and the chakra drain on it wasn't too bad to deal with for short bursts. Within just two hours of training with the jutsu, with him giving pointers to her to help her here and there, Sakura got the jutsu down for the most part. She had trouble keeping the chakra transformation consistent, but was able to do it properly, the exact opposite of the problem Tenten had. Then again, Tenten hadn't been told about how the image of the jutsu in her mind and shaping it was important and Sakura had him to tell her it straight up instead of just having to piece things together from a scroll. But it was still quite impressive to get it mostly down after two hours. Her chakra control really was something impressive indeed. I'm exhausted. Sakura wiped sweat from her brow, bent over in front of him, sweat soaking her top. I feel like I could keel over any second. It was just too bad he was sitting in front of her and not behind, or he was sure to have been getting a real good view. As it was, he was sitting cross-legged on the ground with a scroll open and an ink brush in hand. He was in the process of writing down the instructions for the body flicker jutsu, since he had long since realized she wouldn't have enough chakra to continue training to get it down as well. The Shinkigen was handy like that. You have to work on that stamina. You've only been going a couple of hours. Daiki rolled his eyes, finishing up what he was writing with a little flourish and sealing the ink brush away. Tut tut. What would your dear Sasuke Kuin think about that? The pink haired girl huffed deeply and rolled her eyes. I don't think he's ever considered how my stamina would apply in the bedroom, she retorted. I think you're just projecting. She added Anne with a deep breath, stood up fully and tugged on the collar of her dress to air it out a bit. Oh, I guess so. Fair enough. Daiki nodded, rolling up the scroll and standing up, grinning at her. In that case, you should really work on that stamina. This is for the good of your future Hokage after all. Sorry, Hokage-sama, sir. I'll be sure to work on my lacking stamina, sir. Sakura snorted, giving him a mock salute. Good soldier, Daiki nodded, pleased. It'd be a shame if a lady with a giot like yours didn't have the stamina to use it properly after all. He added, holding the scroll out to her. She blinked, taking it. What's this? She asked, easily ignoring his comment about her behind. Since you're too drained of chakra to continue and I'll be out of the village come tomorrow, I wrote the instructions down for the body flicker, Daiki replied as she took it. It's pretty simply you should be able to get it down even without me coaching you with this. You're pretty talented after all and smart enough to understand it easily. Oh, thanks. The pink-haired girl smiled at his compliment, before her green eyes gleamed with mischief. And about my stamina, you're the one always going on about how big and fat my wagon is. Have you considered that it's making me waste stamina quicker because it weighs me down? He blinked, before laughing at her reply. I didn't actually, good point. He agreed with her. That's a whole lot of asses. Still doesn't mean you can be content with pitiful stamina though. If you want though, I know a good training method for increasing the stamina of girls with wagons like yours. Aha! Uh -huh. Sakura nodded. And let me guess it involves a lot of me bouncing and probably moaning. Squealing actually. 
he corrected her. And your cheeks clapping. Sounds about right with you? She shook her head, before blinking. Wait, how do cheeks clap? She asked, looking confused. Poor Sakura, for all your intelligence and knowledge, you clearly don't know about the true important things in life. Daiki clicked his tongue and shook his head. I suppose, I can take more time out of my busy schedule to teach you though. Sakura nodded. I'll ask Ino. Wait, what? You're talking to her again? Did you make up? Daiki wondered. In the other timeline, they only really made up after fighting in the prelims. That didn't happen here. A bit after the forest, Sakura shrugged. But since I'm not going after Sasuke Kuen anymore, there's really no point to continuing the rivalry over him with her anymore. Fair enough, Daiki nodded. Though, just because you're not doing it anymore doesn't mean her chances are going to improve. Sucks to be her. Sakura shrugged with a smirk. She glanced at the scroll in her hands, before the smirk left suddenly and was replaced by a frown. Which reminds me, she said, and looked him in the eye. If you want, you can get rid of the force palm seal you let me use. It meant a lot you let me use it and it really helped me a ton, but I know it isn't mine or anything like that. Oh right, he'd forgotten that he had given her that, hadn't he? Eh, keep it, he waved her off. Just remember to work on toughening up your arms so you can endure it more. A pretty smile replaced the frown just as quickly as it had appeared. What do you think I've been doing all this month in the first place? It wasn't like Kakashi-sensei left me with anything else to do, Sakura replied, before surprising him by stepping forward and pressing a quick kiss to his cheek. Still, thank you. I mean, this seal actually kind of means a lot to me. It was kind of the origin point for me, you know? Of me getting my head screwed on straight about what being a kunoichi really means. She said as she pulled back, cheeks flushing a light pink. Don't mention it. Daiki just smiled back at her. I'm glad it helped you out. And he was. He was pretty proud of his first seal and its applications in combat and still used it even now quite often. But he wasn't sure if he'd messed some things up that were important, especially intervening as he had in the Forest of Death. The fact his seal that he gave to Sakura had smoothed it over and even gave better results was totally worth giving her it. They stayed there like that, staring into each other's eyes. Ten seconds passed, then thirty. Before long a minute had passed and Sakura's eye twitched. Oh come on what are you waiting for? She growled at him. What? Daiki blinked, confused. Seriously? Aren't you gonna squeeze my butt or spank me like you always do when we're heading different ways? Sakura gave him a dry look. I thought it was pretty obvious we were more or less done and splitting off here for tonight. What with your mission tomorrow and all? I mean, I didn't want to ruin the moment? He offered. Hey, you're also the one who gave me into trouble for it before when I was healing you, remember? And told me you weren't really interested in me if I wasn't being serious. So I backed off beyond the flirting. That was a good talk even. Helped him sort his head out a bit. And now he was just waiting for Ten Ten to sort her own self out before they started things off and tried out dating properly. Sure, he believed he was a free lad to sow his wild oats until then, but Sakura explicitly wasn't interested in just a casual shiboink like Anko had been. And that wasn't so much as a casual shiboink as a transaction. It had been fun either way. Well, it's not about dating right now, is it? I'm just willing to let you have a feel. It's a gratitude thing. Sakura coughed and explained and pivoted gracefully bending forward to reveal her ample, curvaceous wagon and enticingly wiggled it at him invitingly. Come on, you know you want a daiki. You've been making quips about this fat wagon of mine for the last two hours. Once every while, and you instigated a lot of it. Daiki sighed, but his eyes were locked on the view she was giving him and then mentally smacked himself for looking a gift horse in mouth. Not that I'm gonna say no to this. Reaching forward, he took a nice big handful of her giot and squeezed and was honestly surprised when she looked over her shoulder at him with a pleased look. What was even going on here? Is that all you want? She smirked at him. There was a bit of a spring in Sakura's step as she made her way home after parting ways with Daiki. And a sting across her wagon from where he'd spanked her. She was in a good mood. She'd learned a lot over the last hours. Some useful, some kind of crazy. But all in all... She was quite happy with how things had gone. She had no idea why she had been so forward with Daiki. She hadn't changed her opinion, 
She didn't have any interest in just sleeping around even if she was really grateful to him, and he was really hot, and those muscles were drool-worthy. But she couldn't deny. She enjoyed his attention, and his compliments made her puff her meager chest out with pride. Her fat giot had always been one of the things she'd been the most self-conscious about, especially because Eno always used it against her when they insulted each other. Nowadays, she was quite pleased with it, all thanks to Daiki. I have no idea what I'm doing here, Sakura realized, but it was fun at least. Honestly, after Sakura left to head home, Daiki was just pure on bemused. Her attitude right then was a far cry of what she was like in the other timeline when it came to perverted actions. Any perverted action around her there ended up with her fists turning concrete to powder or bones. Poor Naruto, he'd lost count of how many times her fist had smashed his head into the ground with bone-breaking force. Then again, she had tried that with him initially, he just wasn't kind enough to let her do it. Like, he wasn't really going to complain, but it was still a massive turnaround from what her other self was like. Had their talk during the second route really impacted her that much? He stared after the older pink-haired girl's form until she disappeared from good old trusty training ground 69, before deciding to put it and her out of mind for the moment and disappearing with a blur of motion using the body flicker. He headed straight home to his house, reaching his destination in less than a minute. He was half expecting Anko to still be around given his offer to let her chill at his place while he was training with the old man Hokage. Daiki was somewhat relieved she wasn't there though he found with a quick sweep of his eyes. His all-seeing scarlet I allowing him to easily see through every wall in the building. Fun and sexy as Anko was, Daiki had been keeping it suppressed all day, ever since he met with Naruto and helped him get a basic understanding of his abilities as a Jinchuriki, but inspiration had struck him. A new possible way to augment his grind had appeared before him, and now that he was home, he could truly ponder on it. He made his way to his living room and collapsed on his sofa, staring right up at the ceiling, before speaking aloud. What do you think? He asked aloud. It has merit, I won't lie, Isabu replied. The problem is you'll need to design an all-new seal to do it, though admittedly with your other seals you've already laid out the groundwork. That, and you need to be careful not to overdo it, if you do, it will make your chakra fluctuate a lot like his, though not to the same extent and make your chakra harder to control. His idea was simple. Copy Naruto. Not specifically anything he was actually doing himself, but rather what they'd discovered earlier today while inside his seal. The pure yang chakra that made up the half of Karama inside Naruto, making it so the abundance of chakra seeping into him was pure yang, and to his understanding was obviously not only enhancing the quality of his physical growth, but to an extent allowing his physical capabilities to grow passively. It was not some truly massive amount, but say for example that passive growth added a single pound of lifting strength per day. It was a tiny minuscule amount per day, but over time added up massively. Using that one pound example, Naruto as he was now at almost 14 years old, would have been capable of lifting over two tons without ever having to have trained a day in his life. It wasn't like Daiki was all that specifically unhappy with his physical growth at all right now. In fact, he was over the moon about it, the rate he was progressing was utterly absurd compared to the average shinobi or kunoichi. But that simply wasn't good enough when he knew of the kind of monsters that were lurking out there, the kind of monsters that had high chances of making a move not only upon him in the future, but the leaf village and he supposed the world as well. Utterly absurd compared to the average still wasn't enough. People joked all the time on versus threads back home, people pulling out there but how Naruto characters were super weak and couldn't do anything to the likes of Dragon Ball Z characters and people going on and on about how Kishimoto claimed Madara was only as strong as Nappa. Putting all that bullshit aside, it was easy to say stuff like that when it wasn't real, when it was just some losers behind a computer screen fanboying over their favorite anime. But when that reality became real, Daiki wondered what they'd have to say to the fact that Madara could literally create massive meteors, where if a single one came down and hit the planet of his old world, the planet would have become inhabitable and all of humanity would most likely have been wiped out. Or the fact the man could literally pause time with his eyes, or rewind time with his eyes. And that was only his base Manjikyu Sharingan abilities. Daiki wasn't even sure how he was going to counter that in the future. How did one counter the ability to freeze or rewind time? But that was a problem for future Daiki to solve. He the Daiki of the present, 
could only do everything he could upon the path of the grind and squeeze every last drop of grind enhanced strength out where he could. Putting that horrible thought aside for the moment, Isabu coughed. As far as Naruto's growth goes, you're mostly correct. Though given his strength right now and the subpar training he has gone through, even if not his own fault, I'd wager your analogy is a bit off. Strength-wise alone, I'd say if using you as a basis, I'd say roughly three to five times your estimate. Well, it was just an example. Daiki shrugged, banishing the thoughts of Madara once more to the deepest parts of his psyche, where he would do his best not to think on the man again for quite a while. He had to let loose a whistle despite himself. So with no training at all, Naruto would have been capable of lifting between six and ten tons, huh? That wasn't too shabby at all. It didn't compare of course to him right now, since he was literally wearing 30 tons per limb right now and was actually having an easy time moving around with them and would need to upgrade them soon, but still, a passive growth like that would be lovely. But the true kicker was the enhanced physical growth from the overabundance of Yang Chakra. It would increase the rate of his growth by a decent margin. Which would be amazing. It would speed up your timetable a little bit for sure and would offset the fact that you're going to end up Hokage at the rate you're going and be doing paperwork a lot. Isabu teased. Admittedly, the stronger you become physically and the more potent your chakra, the greater our Bijou mode will be. Well, yeah, obviously, since their physical abilities would be combined at that point more or less. Not just physical abilities, our chakra as well, Isabu replied. Remember we Bijou are masses of sentient chakra given form, our physical abilities come from our chakra, not muscles like you humans. It is why I said before that technically yes in pure power and physical ability, Kurama is the strongest of we Bijou by far, because his amount of chakra even in his current state dwarfs the rest of us. Ah, that was actually a little different than he thought about it. He thought it would basically just be his physical abilities and Isabu's own combined, because he was thinking of it like how his strength worked and assumed the Bijou's massive strength and other physical abilities came from their absurd size. But if it was merely because of their chakra then, Yes, no matter what size we are, as long as we have full access to our chakra our strength, speed and such will remain the same. The only thing our size adds in that sense is the sheer scale and weight behind our physical abilities. Isabu explained. This also means that even should the day come where you vastly surpass my abilities as Hashirama and Madara did to even Kurama, the Bijou mode you will have access to with me will forever. Increase in power with each little bit of physical strength and chakra you gain. Huh. That was amazing and it explained a lot. For instance, Kurama. Kurama was monstrously strong no doubt. But the speed he and Naruto moved at during the fourth war in the other timeline, at first he hadn't thought Kurama capable of such a thing, especially in a half-state. But Naruto who had more chakra than the likes of Kisame at that point by far, adding his chakra to the Bijou mode and their combined might looking more like Kurama's chakra plus Naruto's chakra plus Naruto's physical abilities equals Bijou mode output. It made a lot more sense. That first Bijou mode was probably a decent bit stronger than Kurama's own natural full strength before he was halved. The same as my estimates, yes. Isabu agreed. Whoa, 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 wait a minute. Daiki quickly sat up eyes widening as something clicked. At the beginning of the fourth war Naruto and that half of Kurama together had comparable chakra to Hashirama. But through that war, Naruto's grew massively to the point where he was nearly comparable with Hashirama chakra-wise on his own. It was absurd to think about, but true and made some sense. Kurama was constantly regenerating Naruto's own chakra and supplanting it with his own at a constant pace. While Naruto himself had thousands of shadow clones spread across multiple battlefields and was transferring his and Kurama's chakra in the form of bijou cloaks to tens of thousands of people, handling not only his own capacity, but Kurama's at the same time and constantly using it up over and over and over, it was no wonder his chakra capacity grew so massively. But beyond that, it meant that Naruto and Kurama's Bijou mode was continuously evolving and growing stronger through the course of the fourth war at a rapid rate, and then they added sage mode on top of that. And yet Madara beat them with ease, without his eyes, alongside the other eight of you and Gara. Daiki said aloud, once more that monstrous beast of a shinobi rising to the forefront of the topic. What an absolute monster of a unit that freak of nature was. Every time he thought there was nothing more mind-blowing he could think about when it came to that guy, there was always more. To hell that guy, man. Gritting his teeth, Daiki shook his head and banished Madara from his mind and moved on. Assuming we win in the end, 
Doesn't that mean that with the passive growth of the Yang Chakra and the constant Chakra growth I go through thanks to you and my Heavenly Star Seal? He began. That since my life force is ever increasing that will just continue to passively get stronger for all eternity? More or less, yes. Isabu nodded. With that, he would become so in tune with the grind, that the grind would passively enhance him for all time. It always comes back to the grind with you, huh? Isabu snorted. Yes. But among those thoughts, then the greater Isabu's own chakra was, the greater the increase he would passively attain as well. Which meant that, soon he would have to pay a visit not only to the dragon vein, but the mine containing the source for the stone of Jellal. With that, their combined bijou mode would jump massively in power and then increase the rate at which his own chakra grew as well, increasing the rate once more at which their bijou mode's power passively grew. If only there was a way though beyond that to increase Isabu's chakra even more. Well, there was that dumb demon in the land of swamps he had to go beat the crap out of and steal the army of, but that would be minor compared to the dragon vein and mine of Jellal. Speaking of chakra, I think you've reached the point now where you can safely increase the amount of shadow clones you use during training. Isabu piped up, breaking his thought process. He grinned. So jump from 200 to 300 now? That's not a jump, it's a leap, Isabu snorted. But I suppose it should be fine. Perfect. Then while I do that, I'll get working on making a seal to convert chakra into pure yang chakra. He bounced up off the couch and clapped his hands excitedly. I'll add it to the heavenly star seal actually, and the pure yang will then be offset by your chakra filtering into my own, and then I won't need to worry about my balance of chakra fluctuating too much. What about sleeping for your mission tomorrow? Isabu huffed in amusement. Sleep is for weaklings that don't believe in the grind. Daiki merely laughed. He didn't really need much sleep anyway and could go entire days without it easily. Admittedly, the mission tomorrow was important though. He paused. I'll get a few hours in later. There's still a good eight hours before I need to set off for the mission anyway. So much could be done in eight hours after all. From 200 to 300 shadow clones. Eight hours. With 300 shadow clones training their grind loving hearts out, those eight hours actually became more akin to 2400 hours, which in total equaled roughly a hundred days. Nearly a third of a year of training being put into a single night. It was simply absurd how busted the shadow clone technique was in the hands of one like Daiki or Naruto, Chinchurikis with massive amounts of chakra and the healing ability to handle the absurd influx of information one gained from such a training method. The Yang conversion seal was a simple matter. He had after all, created a seal previously to convert the star chakra contained within his heavenly star seal into safe usable chakra to enhance himself with. It was a simple matter of just altering the conversion seal to only convert half of the original makeup and filter it into his own chakra system and body. He didn't even need any of his clones for it. Beyond one to apply the seal to himself. That left the newly spawned 300 clones to work all night on what he wanted. And he decided simply on taking care of something he should have done a long time ago. Learning both the Chidori and the Raisingen as he knew the exact training method and ways to mastery for them, and even a shortcut to skip the initial complexities of the Raisingan. It was merely two hours before he had the Chidori down pat, alongside being able to form a Raisingan with a clone. With 300 clones then working on the Jutsu after the Chidori was completed, and the shortcut to enhance his training, it was all too easy to pick up the intricacies of the pure, mastered Raisingan. Over the course of another two hours, which with his shadow clones was more akin to 600 hours, roughly 25 days. Such was the grandness and sheer complication of a jutsu that was the Raisingan. And it was why as dawn was beginning to approach, Daiki found himself within Isabu's personal dimension. Sitting atop a large rocky outcropping, he formed himself through an earth jutsu. He held one palm up in front of his face, a blinding bright swirling sphere of destruction rotating above the palm of his hand, such an amazing jutsu, Daiki mouthed to himself, awe in his gaze. He was loud in the beautiful blue sphere of power. With his eyes, he could track the many, many different rotating threads of chakra that made up the spiraling sphere, or at least a fraction of them. With the all-seeing scarlet eye, Daiki could make out tens of thousands of different chakra rotations within the sphere before it simply became too much and he completely lost count. But in total, the sheer amount completely dwarfed just mere tens of thousands. And that was where his awe came from. 
How did Minato Namikaze create such a jutsu? The only reason Daiki was able to recreate the jutsu himself was because he knew the exact training method from his knowledge of the other timeline. But the idea of starting at the base and coming up with a jutsu like this boggled his mind. Just from learning and it watching the ways the chakra rotated within his palm within his eyes massively deepened his understanding of chakra. The Yandame Hokage truly was a genius, which makes me wonder how he never managed to take it to the next step. Daiki thought, at the exact moment a screeching chime like noise grated upon his ears. He looked up from the Raisingan just in time to watch one of his clones miles off in the distance plunge down towards the ground, blinding rotating shuriken of wind chakra churning with his palm before he slammed it into the ground. And it erupted into a gargantuan massive dome of grinding chakra and piercing minuscule microscopic wind blades that tore the area asunder, devastating multiple acres of ground within the dimension and leaving a crater a good 50 feet deep within the earth. The wind style, Raisin Shuriken, in contrast to the Raisin Gan itself. The wind style, Raisin Gan and the wind style, Raisin Shuriken were wholly easy to get down. Admittedly he needed clones to use them and it was beyond him as he was currently to figure out how to use them with one hand and no clones, beyond perhaps chakra arms like Naruto did in the other timeline. But even then it boggled him that Minato could create a technique such as the Raisingan, but overlook something as simple as using clones to help form the enhanced versions. Was he just the type that was completely galaxy-brained and simple solutions never occurred to him? Daiki wondered idly, staring at the beautiful devastation wrought by the S-Class Wind Ninjutsu. His first S-Class Jutsu. Technically, the Bijudama was an S-Class Jutsu for sure and his combination of the twin Black Dragon Blizzard and Lightning style was so destructive it could be classified as an S-Class Jutsu as well. But that was two Jutsu in one and the Bijudama technically didn't count as a Ninjutsu. So yes, this was his first S-Class Ninjutsu. Yet, amazing was it was and awesome as it would be as a trump card. He was vastly more excited to have the Raisingan itself now that he understood just how absurdly complicated it was. After all, it was the next step for him he decided when it came to enhancing his chakra control grind. The next step of the agenda was making two Raisingans. And then it was mini Raisingans atop his fingertips. And he would push that as chakra control training every day until he could create ten of them on every single fingertip. And then he would do it while using the tree walking exercise. And then water walking. And then walking atop rushing raging waterfalls. He truly had to thank Minato for the Raisingan. His chakra control training had been slowing down massively lately. But with this, he would be able to push the grind even further beyond. Just looking at the gains he'd made from tonight from learning the Raisingan made giddy. He pulled up his status to look it over. A grin on his face as he saw the gains he'd grinded through the night reflected back at him. Name, Daiki Yuriai Age, 13 Chakra Capacity. 198, 600 slash 198, 600, low tier Kage, strength, 205, endurance, 293, durability, 207, agility, 205, taijutsu, 262 slash 500 ninjutsu, 400 slash 500 jinjutsu, 107 slash 500 bukijutsu, 1, 84 slash 500 chakra control. 350 slash 500 chakra affinities. Lightning. Expert the heavens spark water. Expert the sea parts before you wind. Master the gale bows earth. Adept the earth shakes. Fire. Novice simmering power fuinjutsu. Advanced the breath hitches. His chakra control had risen over 20 in the last night thanks to the Raisingan. And through the Chidori, Raisingan, wind style, Raisingan and Wind Style. Raisin Shuriken, his ninjutsu stat had hit 400. 400. It was his highest skill stat by far now. He wondered, just how high was old man Saratobis for him to be able to recreate jutsu like the Raisingan and Chidori from just a glance. He couldn't even imagine that kind of ability right now without the Shinkigan. He had to have been at like 500 or near that, right? Or was he somehow beyond that? It wouldn't surprise him. That old monkey was a monster. And speaking of that old monkey, Daiki sighed waving away his status screen and dispelling the Raisingan in his hand as he stood up. It's almost time to go meet him and Anko to start the mission. 
Huh? He mused. That was disappointing. He'd hit an all-new milestone in his grind and wanted to pursue even further. Even the fact he'd have a mission all alone with Anko playing honeypot for him to stop any ideas going to his head for wanting to leave for Miss to bed Meitarumi couldn't change that. Anko was a stacked babe. And Meitarumi was no doubt going to be shaboink on legs. But the grind was eternal. And he already so many ideas raging around his head. Like, for instance, what would a lightning raisingan be? Lightning was all about shocking and piercing a target. So a drill, maybe? He had a flash of an imaging in the head, of a black and red drill-like blade, a spiraling red hurricane of energy forming around it before being unleashed in a devastating churning beam of destruction that pierced through all and wiped out everything in its path. A and Enuma Elish. Could he come up with something like that with a mastered lightning-style Raisingan? If the absurd amount of destruction between Chidori and Raisingan clashing was anything to go by, the absurd destruction wrought by such a thing might be comparable. Or what about that Niga Naruto Menma with his absurd evil version of the Raisin Shuriken, the spiraling fear wheel that could destroy over 70 miles of land in one shot? So many ideas he wanted to experiment with. You'll have time for that later, you have enough on your plate between that seal you're trying to create, Isabu input. Not to mention, you haven't even mastered your lightning affinity yet. You don't even know how, you only have the instructions so far for the fire and earth affinity training. Well, he wasn't wrong. He supposed he could look into the fire-style Raisingan first once he got done with them. Or the Meteor Raisingan, as it was actually called in the games. Jiraiya had an interesting way of doing it to get around the adding fire element chakra to it. Still, as always it was kind of pitifully sad that at this rate, the element he'd master last was his actual inborn affinity of lightning. Well, whatever. Daiki stretched out his arms for a moment. Before speaking, Senpo, he said, drawing on Isabu's chakra. And a moment later, he returned to the backyard of his sweet bachelor pad. Guess I'll go for a shower and get something to eat before I go to meet Anko and the old man. He mused. He made a quick shadow clone and dispelled it a moment later, spreading his new thoughts to all his other clones before doing just that. It was as he hopped into the shower, the water kept nice and cool to wash away any tiredness and revitalize him that Isabu spoke up again. I've been keeping track of something for the past few hours since you added that new young conversion seal. The three-tailed beast suddenly brought up. Standing under the cold spray of the shower, Daiki hummed in askance. Hmm, he prompted. Hashirama cells, he said. And if he weren't under the spray of water... Daiki's eyes would have opened up and shot wide at the sudden topic. Between me, your collection of chakra from Naruto and Sasuke and this new young conversion seal, I think you could handle intaking some and integrating them without being overwhelmed. Amazing as that would be, that's not something I really want to try, Daiki replied on instinct. His cells are like a cancer. It's too big of a chance of messing me over to want to do it. Sucky as that was, Hashirama's cells were absurd. Not only would integrating them give him the wood style, it would give him an absurd healing factor and massively boost his life force, his physical abilities, his chakra, and even possibly enhance his ability when it came to Senjutsu. Hashirama's cells turned Abito from a subpar chunin to being capable of slaughtering a whole squad of Umbu Black Ops, and in a few years made him capable of taking on Minato at his peak while alive. It was too bad though, because with them enhancing his growth rate, many of his plans would come to fruition that much quicker. Yes, I have a theory on how that works, Isabu said. There's a thing I should actually correct you on. While I'm unsure of how Hashirama Senju died, what I do know is that it must have been an absurd situation. Because what you know of Hashirama's healing abilities isn't even close to what he could heal from. Daiki stepped out of the cold spray of the shower and wiped the water from his face. Running a hand up through his hair and slicking it back, What do you mean? He asked. As far as he was aware... Nothing short of decapitating and crushing Hashirama's brain would have killed him. No, not even that, Isabu promptly refuted. In actuality, even if his entire body was reduced to dust, as long as a single cell of him remained with enough chakra, he would regenerate. There was a reason not even Madara Uchiha with the ability to stop or rewind time could defeat him Daiki. As long as he had chakra, he was unkillable unless his entire body was erased from existence. What? What? How that was absurd. That was like cell or Majin Butir bullshit. How the hell did he even die then? 
Hashirama had even more chakra than full power Karama, and had basically the most busted physically durable body in the world, more or less. There were only a few contenders like Naruto and the third Rakage that could compete with his absurd body. There wasn't even a record of how he died in the history texts. Frankly, I couldn't tell you either, Isabu replied. The important matter though is the strength of your Yang Chakra with your Yang Conversion Seal may be enough alone for you to withstand the integration of his cells. If not, though, I theorize that Madara managed it because of the traces of Indra within his chakra and the cells more or less recognizing him as related to Hashirama closely. With as much chakra as you've taken from both Sasuke and Naruto, with the traces of Indra and Ashura, you may be able to trick the cells into believing they are a natural part of you if you flush your system with enough of it. Daiki supposed that did make sense in a way, but it was still a massive risk to take. He'd taken massive risks a lot so far, but in taking the cells of Hashirama Senju with the possibility of a cancerous growth of the man growing out of his body and trying to supplant his own made him shiver. And that was if he didn't just turn into a tree. That is where I come in, if nothing else I should be able to suppress the cells to a degree to make it easier, and if things go wrong I'll rip the cells out of you with my chakra. Isabu said then in return, though it'll be agonizing if I do need to do that, though that's obvious it would be like ripping the sinew from your body piece by piece to a degree. Lovely. Peachy even. Just what he needed to think about before he had breakfast, his sinew being torn out. But then what was a little agony to an enhancement of the grind? I'll think about it. Daiki replied as he stepped out of the shower and grabbed a nice fluffy towel to dry off with. Beyond anything else I'll need to figure out where to get some of his cells without anyone the wiser anyway. Granted he knew a few places where there was some, but all them were kind of risky. Like a Beto's hideout, Danzo, Zetsu, that kind of thing. Hashirama's cells, huh? Daiki mused as he left his house behind. Usually, he would roof hop to his destination in the village and arrive within moments. For now, he was just strolling through the village and taking his time as he pondered on the previous subject brought up by Isabu. There was another thing he'd overlooked that would come into play once, or rather if he managed to get his hands on some of those cells and integrate them properly. Shursue's eyes. The abilities of his eyes, his absolute hypnosis jutsu had a recharge time. A very large recharge time that even he usually couldn't get around. Danzo had sidestepped that issue with Hashirama's cells. On top of that, Hashirama's cells, alongside a big enough store of Naruto and Sasuke's chakra, would quite possible make evolving them straight to the Rinnegan much easier than he initially planned. And of course it would repair any of the deterioration they would incur through using the Manjikyu. Granted he'd already acquired ways to sidestep that issue himself, but it was still another nicely added on benefit that would make it passive rather than him using his other abilities to deal with it. Utterly absurd. Right now, Daiki was only a player of note because of Isabu. It would take quite a while before he was a real player in the game himself. But, if this did pan out in the future, he could jump straight up onto the board himself instead of having to ride Isabu onto it. That was just how potent and powerful Hashirama's cells were. The man was literally the Broly of this universe. None of his power came from having Ashura clinging to him. He was just a goddamned mutant freak of nature. Literally. Well for now it didn't matter. What did matter was completing his bloodline usurpation seal. Shursui's eyes were a non-factor until then. They were also a very important factor that would increase his and Isabu's battle power substantially. With them and Shursue's Susanoo and Isabu's Bijou mode, they could form the majestic attire Susanoo. With that as a trump card, there would be very few people currently alive capable of defeating them. He would become a true Hokage candidate, undefeatable more or less on the battlefield. Plus it would be so cool. Plus all the other fun things he had at his disposal to bolster such a form even further. Though he was forced to put such thoughts out of mind for the moment as his destination, one of the gates to the village came into sight. The old man was as expected already waiting in front of the closed gates, though surprisingly Anko was there as well, casually sitting atop the small registry hut that was manned by Shinobi at all times when the gates were open. Actually maybe that wasn't so surprising considering how punctual she was in searching him out before. Took you long enough brat. She grinned at him idly kicking her legs and forth as he approached. <clears throat> he crossed his arms and smirked at her. The one true future Hokage is never late, nor is he early. 
He arrives exactly when he means to and not a moment later. He replied, Oh yes, my mistake. Sorry about that future Hokage-sama. How could I ever have been so foolish? Enko snorted, rolling her eyes. That is a good one actually. Old man Haruzen hummed, tapping his chin with a light smile. I'll have to keep that in mind the next time those advisors of mine nag. Always happy to help old man. Daiki grinned. Though you didn't need to see me off, no need to worry. I've got this mission in the bag. I have full faith in you, more or less. Haruzen laughed back lightly. You doubt the ultra-amazing future Hokage? Daiki asked and raised an eyebrow at him challengingly. Your libido at least, Haruzen snorted. As the current reigning ultra-amazing Hokage, even I wouldn't trust myself if Meitarumi tried to seduce me. That woman and her bosom are something else. Jiraiya would happily start the next Shinobi World War just to peek on her. Jiraiya would start the next Shinobi World War for a pair of Tsunade's used undies. That's not exactly a high bar to pass. Daiki shot back. Also, that's traitor talk. Don't make me arrest you old man. I'm the future Hokage, you know. I've got some real pull with the establishment. Truly, Jiraiya has a pitiful reputation. Haruzen chortled a bit. Most of your pull with the establishment comes from me, so I don't think you could. Well, Danzo might help you, but he's a bit of a clown sometimes. Either way, you'll understand when you meet the Mizukage. Her beauty is not to be underestimated. Bruh, what the hell was Mei Terumi like in this world for the old man to actually be serious about this warning? Was she some super succubus or something? Or had it just been so long since the old got his pecker wet that he was overestimating how hot she was? A dry spell like that must have been killer. Couldn't be him. Hey, actually you've seen Mei Terumi before, right? Since you were in Yagura? Daiki asked the bijou within him. How hot is she? You realize I have no interest in human beauty? Or even understand it? You're all hairless monkeys to me look wise. He could feel Isabu roll his eyes and reply. Oh, it was on. Yeah, well you're a hairless turtle. Daiki shot back, maturely. Oh, you noticed? Can you also count to ten? Isabu snorted at him. Prick, he could have at least told him how her rack compared to Anko's. Though speaking of Anko. Hey now old man. You're gonna hurt my pride as a woman here. Anko cut in, hopping off the roof where she sat. This kid couldn't get enough of me before his training with you. I know how hot she is. Hell I'd hit that and I'm not a horny little brat or old man. But thinking she could nab him with me right here is just insulting. Oh ho ho. Saratobi gave Daiki a perverted grin. A flush appearing on his cheeks. Before promptly coughing and turning away. Well, that is of course without taking you into account Anko. I obviously chose you for a reason. That's better. Enko smirked smugly. You underestimate the one true future Hokage. Daiki huffed. If she's that hot, I'll just bed her and Enko at the same time. Such is the power of the future fifth Hokage. Hey, if that's what it takes. Enko merely shrugged. Well, I do wish the third Hokage spot came with such a power. Haruzen shook his head in amusement. But, amusing shenanigans aside... Do you have a plan on how you're going to approach this? His joking tone shifted and disappeared. And Daiki mirrored him, his arms loosening from where they were crossed over his chest. Coming down to his side and his facial muscles tightened as his eyes narrowed seriously. I do, he nodded. In fact, I have a few. I'll use them all to force negotiations into our favor. Though one of those plans will require us to make a quick pit stop at the Land of Waves. The Land of Waves, huh? The Sandame Hokage mused, before nodding a moment later in understanding. I see, I understand. That is not a bad idea at all. I suppose you found out about it from Kakashi or a member of his team. More or less, Daiki nodded and replied in return. It's a good option to play, but it's only one of four or five I've prepared. Beyond knowing where the rest were, knowing who was controlling Yagura, knowing of Aos Byakugan that was stolen from them and a few more things on top of Kubikurabocho, he was quite confident in how this was going to go. Especially because they were the ones negotiating from the point of strength. The village hidden in the mist was by far the weakest of the five great shinobi nations right now. The land of waves? Anko chimed in. What's over there that's good enough to give us an edge in negotiations with the mist? 
It's where Team Seven fought and killed Zabuza Momochi of the Seven Swordsmen of the Mist. Daiki turned his head to her and explained. For whatever reason, Kakashi thought it was a good idea to leave the Kubikirabocho at the grave they built for him and his apprentice. Ha! Huh, that would be a pretty card to play. Anko whistled, before promptly groaning. Though what the hell Kakashi? He used it as a lesson for his team, so I can't truly be too out of sorts with him over it. Haruzen mused. It was important for them, meaning he babied them. Enko rolled her eyes. Pretty much, Kakashi is always has a problem sealing the deal. He could have easily sent a shadow clone to grab it while Team 7 were distracted. Daiki greed. God, he didn't understand that guy. It was nice and respectful of him to do such a thing for Zabuza and Haku. But the world didn't run on respect and being nice. This is why he's going to die a virgin. That got a chuckle out of both Enko and the old man neither coming to Kakashi's defense, which was amusing in of itself. It only lasted a moment though before the seriousness was back. Then I suppose it's time you make your way, Haruzen stated. Good luck on your mission. Keep your guard up and don't show any weakness. Give me a moment and I'll have the gates open for you to head out. No need, Daiki said, holding a hand up to stop him. There's not exactly a long time until the Chunin exams, so I want to make this quick. Yeah. Well, unless you're going to pull the Yandame's Horatian out of your butt kid and teleport us over there, we're going to need to go there on foot, Anko pointed out, before blinking and giving him a weird look. You didn't actually learn that, did you? Heh. A bit of pride warmed in his chest at the thought that was an option she couldn't put out of mind when it came to him. Sadly, that wasn't it. Besides, even if he did, he'd need to have a marker in the hidden mist village to flash on over there. No, but I've got the next best thing. Daiki replied with a smirk and stepped back away from them both to get some room. A power I stole while in the forest of death from some genin from the hidden star village. My you do get around, don't you? Hiruzen seemed to clock on immediately and gave an exasperated, yet amused shake of his head. Daiki brought his hands together in the modified hand seal specifically created to manipulate the star chakra. The fingers beside his pinky fingers and his middle fingers curled to his palm and touched the knuckles together while his pinkies, index fingers and thumbs touched together to form an arch weird hand seal. Anko pointed out, watching him with interest. Ninja style, Kajaku, Daiki declared as he used the technique. Green chakra exploded into existence around him, forming an armor of shimmering green chakra of two different greens. One light, the other dark, rippling up and down like a series of waves, Daiki narrowed his eyes and concentrated, spreading his chakra out and a moment later, the armor of chakra around his body spread out at the back, forming four wide jagged wings, two towards his feet, the other extending beyond his shoulders, and so large they covered the entirety of his body in their shadow. Of powerful green chakra. Impressive, I have to admit. Haruzen nodded, smiling lightly. Whoa! The heck is this? Anko marveled, walking over to him and extending a hand to touch one of the wings. Whoa! It feels solid like steel. But wings, huh? You telling me you can fly, brat? Something like that. He grinned. Flying with the Kajaka method through the star chakra was a bit odd Daiki had to admit. He'd never personally done it in his original physical body, and left it up to his clones to perfect the technique. And its many variations. It was not actually flying in the traditional sense when one thought of flying with a technique or ability. But rather, he had clad himself within his chakra like a shell of chakra aura that highlighted the shape of his body, akin to a plane and carried himself through the air with the chakra. To be perfectly honest, the Kajaka method wasn't all that complicated as far as chakra techniques went. In act, it didn't even come close to the complexity of the Raisingan. It was simply a technique for shaping chakra that had been enhanced by the star chakra of the fallen meteor from the star village, not only making the user's chakra more potent and stronger but denser as well and by concentrating it, compressing the chakra it was able to take on a corporeal solid form. That was probably why the various uses of the Kenjaka method were based on physical items like ropes, blades weapons and even full-on animals. As it was, at the end of the day it was still flying. And it wasn't long before Daiki was soaring through the air towards the land of waves, carrying a completely non-plussed purple-haired special Jonin bridal style. Hmm. Anko hummed, arms wrapped around his neck, but her pupilless eyes on the ground multiple hundreds of feet below. You know, 
I thought flying would be more exciting than this. They were so high they weren't all that far from the clouds. In fact, they were nearly a thousand feet in the air by his estimates. Daiki raised a brow at her, taking his eyes off of the horizon to look down at her. It wasn't like there were any obstacles in the air anyway. What do you mean? He asked. Frankly, he thought it was pretty neat. Anko shrugged. I mean, it's kind of cool cruising through the air and all. But if I really wanted to be this high up, I could just jump, you know? Well, she wasn't wrong. Honestly, sometimes he forgot how truly absurd his and other ninjas' physical abilities truly were. Even with the memories of his other life, he was just so used to it. I mean, we can go at it again after the mission, Daiki pointed out. Can try out some tricks like going in loop-de-loops or going super high. We can even go to space if you want. And wasn't that an odd thing to think about? If he really wanted to, he could fly to the goddamn moon if he wanted with this technique. Sure, he couldn't exactly move at his complete maximum speed in flight like this right now, so in a straight path he was slower at flying than just flat out running, but the distance between the moon and earth from his other life was just a bit below 400,000 kilometers. At his top flight speed, he could make that in a few hours at most easy. And that was another thing he needed to look into. Why could they breathe in space, a vacuum, but not underwater? The physiology of his people were just damn weird. Heh, maybe we're part alien like Frisia or something and that's why we can do it. He snorted. Well, that might be fun. I can't jump that high. Anko grinned, before shaking her head. But let's get serious for a minute, brat. You've told me about the Kubikur Bocho, and the old man has told me to follow your lead for this mission for the most part. But what else have you got planned for when we get to the Hidden Mist? All right, time for seriousness, then. Brute force? Daiki replied making her eyebrows rise higher, but she didn't interrupt and waited for him to continue. Specifically, we already start from the position of strength in negotiations because quite frankly, we're the strongest village. The biggest threats of all towards the leaf were Anoki himself and Killer B. Anoki's particle jutsu was just that bullshit powerful, and of course Killer B was a full-on S-rank shinobi himself before ever taking Gyuki and him being a perfect Jinchuriki into account. Even as they were now, Daiki was sure he and Isabu could not beat them in a one-on-one -on -one fight. But at the end of the day, even A the Rakage was more of a non-issue compared to them. And more so, they didn't need to bed dealt with by him either. Even if Mist, Cloud and Stone teamed up to take Konoha on, he was sure Konoha would win. The most standout threats were as said Anoki and Killer B, but beyond them the only true standouts were Mei Terumi and A the Rakage. But between Old Man Third, Danzo, Jiraiya, Kakashi and Guy, they could be dealt with. Especially with Tenzo or Yamato or whatever he preferred in the back pocket, he would be real trouble for Killer B. As long as they were waylaid, that would leave Daiki himself free to rampage as he pleased. And with the Shinkigan and the ability to fly, he attacked villages remotely as he pleased. The ability to hide his chakra as he pleased and enter Bijou mode instantly and use the Bijudama with all the backing of Isabu meant there was little they could do to stop him beforehand. Unlike the Flowery Way villages acted like the Jinchuriki were a war deterrent, he was like a true nuke. One Bijudama that they were unprepared for, that was all it would take to ruin even one of the great five elemental villages. And as soon as he did, he could flee and go to another village after completely disappearing from both view and senses. He was a legitimate stealth nuke. That was of course not even taking into account that Anoki and A hated each other so an alliance was unlikely especially because Killer B would be needed to attack from the forefront and A would never allow that. If Mei Terumi is intelligent at all, she'll realize that and understand at the very base that an alliance with us will be a massive benefit for her village. Daiki continued onwards. The problems are of course me holding the Sanbai and the Kiba blades that I don't plan to give up at all, but I'll be bringing them Kubikurabocho to soften that blow a bit. On top of that, one of their top ninja have a Byakugan that was stolen from us, if they want to demand any of what I have back, I'll demand the Byakugan from him. And of course, there's the kicker that I came into possession of the Sanbai and the Kiba Blades when one of their missing ninja planned to attack Kanoha. So they have no fault but their own. MMMM. Anko hummed thoughtfully. Pretty logical and well thought out. The only problem is ninja villages aren't exactly logical when it comes to this kind of thing. If they were the Great Shinobi Wars would have never happened. The Great Shinobi Wars happened because Hashirama was a hippie, and when he died, and Madara was presumed dead as well, the other shinobi nations with their Jinchuriki in pocket thought they were contenders for the big dog ribbon. They were not. Well, 
I've got more up my sleeve, Daiki shrugged. Like I know where the rest of their missing swords are, for instance. You do. Enko blinked. How'd you find that out? That's a big mystery a lot of people have been curious about for a while. Where to brat like you come across that knowledge? The sandby? Well, technically I guess. Daiki smirked. Actually, it was part of the information I got from your old sensei. He has them, alongside a lot of other things that I wouldn't mind taking from him personally. Like that horn of Gyuki, for instance. With it, that previous Jinchuriki of the Eight Tails before B, Fukai was able to enter a full version 2 state. And not a lower tier one like the Gold and Silver Brothers, where they could reach six tail states from the amount of chakra they got from Karama. But rather a full eight-tailed version 2 state. He assumed it could grant the full eight-tailed version 2 strength, since it was a large piece of Gyuki's body, and had the same output, it just did not have the same store of energy the full Gyuki's body had. Either way, it was a potent item that lacked the true will of the Bijou and would be much easier to tame. If he got his hands on it, Daiki could give it to Isabu to empower him, or even possibly make a Suedo Jinchuriki of his own choice. He wasn't sure who he'd pick, but Kakashi for instance with the ability to enter a full eight-tailed version 2 state, would make for quite the strong ally to have on his side. And it would also go a long way to mitigating the problem he had with his Sharingan. Or perhaps Sasuke. A pseudo Jinchuriki Sasuke. Considering his sheer potential would be amazing for the future if he couldn't stop the revival of Madara. He for sure was going to try his damn hardest to stop it from ever occurring. But it was best to plan for the worst. Of course it was him. Anko sighed. Why am I even surprised? Honestly at this point I wouldn't be surprised if he mind-controlled Itachi or something and made him slaughter the Uchiha clan or did it himself in disguise. Yeah, funnily enough, even with all the knowledge of this world he had, if he was told that he'd believe it, Orochimaru was just that guy. It wasn't long before they arrived in the Land of Waves, barely even approaching a half an hour even at a casual speed. The distance between Kanoha and the Land of Waves after all, was merely a thousand and five hundred miles give or take a few. And even that was boosted a bit by them taking a bit to find the exact location of Zabuza and Haku's graves. The graves as it turned out, weren't far from the massive bridge known as the Great Naruto Bridge, just across the water, and a little bit into the forest beside the shore. I can't believe that Brad has a bridge named after him. Anko snorted after they landed on the shore and made their way through the forest towards their target. The kid was alright I guess during the second round, but not really anything special, pretty sure I was stronger at the same age. Probably, though you'd have a tough time with him now, Daiki shrugged. I helped him get a little bit of control of the QB's power yesterday, with it he should be well capable of crushing your standard Jonin. It was weird to say standard or even average when it came to Jonin, they were the elite of the world. Less than 5% of Shinobi ever reached such strength, but that was just how things were for Jinchuriki, especially the Jinchuriki of the Kyubi. Even in his own base state, in a pure on physical fight, Daiki would lose to Naruto in his one-tailed state as he was currently. I ain't a standard Jonin, that's Kurinai, hell I'd put her below your average Jonin. Anko rolled her eyes. I think I could take him even with it, especially after I got full control of this. As she finished speaking, Familiar black flame like marks spread across her body in its entirety, and she smirked at him. The fully controlled curse mark level 1. And without the shard of Orochimaru in it, probably more potent than the standard one the likes of the sound for had by his own estimates. Been training with it, huh? He noted, the ease she pulled on it with was telling, and he could see with his eyes as the chakra running through her tenketsu strengthened. You know there's actually a second stage to the curse seal, it makes it even stronger though when using it, it tends to give you a weird transformation. One of Orochimaru's little boy toys even grows a tail. Anko blinked, before snorting. I'm assuming you've got it then? You do love bragging about getting your hands on all this crap after all. Trying to rub your superiority in again. I actually don't, Daiki replied, shaking his head. I could get, but I don't wanna. It would look really stupid with my Jinchuriki forms. He admitted, looking away. Anko burst out laughing. Is that right? Don't want to look less cool, huh? She teased. And you wonder why I call you a brat. Not just that. Daiki protested but didn't look back and keep his eyes on the foliage of the forest. There's this chick that works for Orochimaru, part of his little guard operation. 
When she takes the second form, she fills out more, her skin turns dark and she grows horns, she looks kind of like a demon actually. And well, he didn't even need to finish, Anko's laughter became louder and louder, pure on hilarity. Want a little human dominating demon roleplay, huh brat? She guffawed, and he turned back to see her pointing at him, laughing so hard tears came to her eyes. Let me guess, you want to use those horns like handlebars as well, huh? How'd you know that? Daiki couldn't help but gape at her. Kid please, you aren't that deep? Anko continued laughing, waving her arm at him in a wishy-washy manner. I spent more than twelve hours getting railed cross-eyed by you. You were loving dominating me, making me call you daddy. The second you said she had horns and looked like a demon, I clocked on. He felt his cheeks heat up. He wasn't that predictable, was he? You want to try and get the second form? He raised an eyebrow at her. Maybe I'll get lucky and you'll get the same kind of form. Oh no. Another 12 hours getting railed stupid after a power up. I'm so scared. Anko snorted. Kid, don't threaten me with a good time. Just as Daiki was about to retort with a real zinger, they stepped into a clearing and a pair of crude grave markers came into view. They were simple, roughly hewn small wooden crosses. One with a sash wrapped around it and the other a massive blade that even stabbed into the dirt towered into the air above both graves. It may have been named the decapitating carving knife, but the Kubikur Bocho was more akin to a buster sword in Daiki's opinion. It was absolutely huge, taller than both he and Anko were, over six feet in length by his estimates. Damn. So that's the sword wielded by the demon of the hidden mist. Huh? Anko whistled. Man, no wonder weaklings crapped themselves from him. A freaking demon hurling around a beast of a blade like that. Even I might have been a bit afraid of him when I was eight years old. Well, aren't you a big badass? Daiki snorted and made his way over to the grave. A sexy badass, actually. But you already knew that considering how you couldn't get enough of me. Enko corrected. Guess so. Daiki shrugged. Usually, he would fire back with some witty banter. Being the king of epic wit that he was but his attention was fully drawn by the blade. He wrapped his arm around the hilt and with a slight tug, pulled it free from the ground and lifted it high up into the air. This is, he frowned, staring at the blade. Specifically, his eyes were on the handle of the blade. Just like the Kiba blades with the Shinkigan, he could see straight inside it and see that like them, there were seals within the handle of the blade. There was a lot less of them than the Kiba blades, and they were less complicated than the ones within the Kiba blades, though they were still very advanced seals. Making seals that small for instance in the first place was a stupidly advanced skill and one of the basis for his bloodline usurpation seal. If it was the him of just over a month ago, he'd have been completely lost on the seals within. The fact he could more or less understand them was a testament to how far he'd come as a user of Fuinjutsu he was sure. It seems to be an absorption type seal that then amplifies the purity of what it absorbs, in this case completely taking in the iron and chakra from blood and using it to generate more of the blade. He mused. He'd wondered before why the Kubikur Bocho couldn't just restore itself with normal metal or something. He'd solved that with this examination of the blade. After all, the Kubikur Bocho, it seemed, was completely made out of neutral chakra metal the kind that could really only be found in large quantities in the land of iron. And a lot of it had been used in the formation of the blade. What an absurd weapon. Who the hell made this thing? This thing could literally easily be used to create an unlimited supply of neutral chakra or, of course the amount of blood it needed was absurd, and the sheer potency of the chakra in the blood would affect it as well. The iron in the blood formed the shape, the chakra in the blood gave it the effect. Such an amazing blade. But if he could reverse engineer it, which he was sure he could give in some time, like a week or so to work on it alone, he could gain an unlimited stock of neutral chakra or... Hey! He took his eyes off the blade in his hand and turned to Anko. How about we make camp here for the night? Why? Anko raised an eyebrow, crossing her arms. Weren't you the one who said you wanted to get all this done with quickly, and that's why you pulled your flying crap out of your butt? That was before I realized how absurd this sword is. Daiki replied, shaking his head. Check this out, he said. He held out his other hand, summoning one of the Kiba blades into it, and a moment later a buzzing aura of lightning chakra surrounded it. 
He swung with all his might, and a screeching buzz echoed through the forest as the lightning fong blade clanged against it, before slowly beginning to carve through the metal of the blade itself. W, what the hell are you doing, idiot? Anko gaped at him, but she didn't move to stop him. He didn't reply and grit his teeth as he forced the blade through bit by bit, until a few seconds later, half of the massive buster blade dropped to the ground, sawed in half by his attack. Watch! Daiki repeated, bringing the jagged end of the cut blade up as he returned the Kiba blade to the Dimension Force seal before raking it down the entire length of his arm. A massive gash been torn down the length of his arm, an eruption of blood spraying out through the air and a bunch of it coating the blade. Brat, what the hell are you doing? Have you lost your me? Dash Anko stepped forward to stop him, only to stop and gape even more as the jagged blade in his hand absorbed the blood and before their eyes, regrew a few centimeters of the blade it had lost. What the absolute hell just happened? Daiki grinned massively. The ability of this blade is to absorb blood with chakra in it and regenerate the blade if broken. He explained. And this blade itself is made from neutral chakra or, so it's a chakra blade. Normally this would be impossible, but with my regeneration I can basically dash. You can make free chakra or... Anko finished for him, mouth hanging low for a moment before a massive excited smile spread across her face. Holy crap kid, this is incredible, more than she knew actually. He had a bunch of chakra blades he stole from those punks in the village of artisans within the land of loot. Once he recreated the seals within the Kubikirabocho, he could apply them to all of them. And more or less, thanks to his own absurd regeneration and chakra amount, he could farm chakra blades of all elements infinitely, if slowly. But that wasn't just it either. With access to free chakra or of all types, he could actually experiment on something. He'd had the thought a while ago but dismissed it. His chakra armor. It had such a perfect blend of wind and water chakra, it could reproduce the ice style. In fact, it flat out amplified both of those elements as well. If he could get the ratio done right, he could have a perfect blend of all five elements and then seal them inside himself. Not only would that amplify his elemental techniques, but also ice style, magnet style, scorch style, boil style, magma style, mud style, storm style, perhaps even particle style and more would all be within reach. Or was that dust style? A sigh echoed within his head. Looks like I'm going to need to expend a lot of chakra to keep you in good enough shape to not exhaust yourself doing this. Isabu noted. I'll make your pond bigger. Daiki promised in return. Fine, though I want a little more lily pads, and a nice little tunnel part where I can go when I want to sleep, also I want some koi. Isabu replied. Fair enough, fair enough. Damn. I wasn't expecting this. Daiki whistled as he stared at his status window the next morning. You should have, Isabu yawned, you expended the entirety of your chakra more than 10 times over. You literally regenerated that blade 186 times. That he did. Daiki glanced away from the status screen to the giant buster blade stabbed into the ground beside him. Fully whole once more. he just finished up not long ago and had been at it for nearly 24 hours with a few breaks in between to eat and rest a little bit. He now had a full 185 halves of Kubikirabocho within the seal upon his palms. A full on near 6,000 pounds on neutral chakra or considering a mere 20 pounds of it would be enough to make a good full chakra blade and neutral chakra or blades were the most expensive, he was sitting on a literal gold mine right now. And that wasn't the only fruit of his labor. He glanced back at the status screen and felt a massive green spread across his face. Because he'd finally done it. Broken into the 200,000 mark with his chakra. Name, Daiki Yurii Age. 13 chakra capacity. 208. 083 slash 208. 083. Low tier Kage. Strength. 205. Endurance. 294. Durability. 207. Agility. 205. Taijutsu. 264 out of 500 ninjutsu. 400 slash 500 jinjutsu. 108 slash 500 bukijutsu. 185 slash 500 chakra control. 351 slash 500 chakra affinities. Lightning. Expert the heaven spark water. Expert the sea parts before you wind. Master the gale bows earth. 
Adept the earth shakes fire. Adept heat rises few and jets. Advanced the breath hitches. Forget breaching it. He jumped over it because of the sheer amount of chakra he'd expended with Isabu's help. His chakra coils had been taxed heavily. Honestly, they literally ached a bit right now because of the massive growth they went through the night through this brute force method. And that wasn't all, either. The hundred clones that weren't dedicated to working on the bloodline user patient seal inside Isabu's personal dimension had managed to get the shadow of the dancing leaf down and bring his fire style training up to the adept tier. He glanced to his side, peering through the distance of the forest to see Anko on her way back and dismissed his status screen before reaching over to the massive blade at his side and sealing it within the dimension force seal. With that done, he began to stretch out his body. A few moments later, Anko returned to the clearing and noted instantly the absence of a blade. Oh, you done then? Can we finally get a move on? She asked. Seriously. Amazing as that was. Watching you cut yourself over and over got boring real fast. For all her dedication to the mission, nobody was immune to boredom. More or less, Daiki shrugged. I just have one more thing to take care of, but it'll only take a minute or two. He replied as he continued stretching. Oh, thank hell for that. Anko groaned. Seriously, you're so weird kid. I was so bored I was literally inviting you to take me to pound town again. But you barely even paid me attention. She did indeed. That was how bored she was. You wouldn't even make a clone to do it. She whined. He shrugged. The grind always comes first. And I needed every bit of chakra. I hate you. Anko pouted. Cool story, bro. Daiki replied with a smirk, finishing his stretches quickly, before turning on his heel and making his way towards the twin graves at the end of the clearing. Anko huffed, rolling her eyes. Don't tell you want to pay your respects or something? She asked. To some random missing ninja I never even met? Daiki scoffed. No, I just want some of their flesh. He said as he formed a familiar hand seal and spawned a small group of shadow clones into existence that immediately began digging up the graves of Zabuza and Haku. You what? Anko stared at him blankly. There's a special jutsu I'll soon have access to when we get back to the village. Daiki explained as the ground was torn up in just a few moments, exposing two rotting corpses. I need the DNA of dead people to use it though. It had only been a few months since their deaths so the corpses were mostly intact. Even if they were half-eaten and infested with maggots. They weren't as bad as Shursue's corpse was, though, and only stank half as bad. You know, kid, if you weren't so obsessed with tits and giats, I'd think you were my old bastard of a sensei in a new flesh suit. Enko shook her head. Orochimaru wishes. Daiki snorted as he summoned a kunai from his seal and climbed into Haku's grave and cut a portion of her rotting skin from her neck, Ha, Haku is a chick. He blinked. And going by the wrapping under the clothing around the chest and the structure of her body, Haku was actually stacked. And her hips were amazingly wide. Damn, what a waste of a babe. Shrugging, he clambered out of her grave and hopped into Zabuza's to do the same. Once he was done, he hopped back out and let his clones begin filling them in again. Kakashi will be pissed you know for desecrating their graves if he finds out. Anko pointed out. Those kids of his probably will be too. Don't care. Daiki shrugged with a snort. Friends and people he cared about or not, he wouldn't let their silly little baby feelings get in the way of gaining another advantage. Once he could use the Edo Tensei Jutsu, he'd be capable of summoning Zabuza and Haku if he so needed. If it came down to it, he'd make his own goddamn ninja zombie army first. Me either really... Anko smirked. I'm just saying because I want you to treat me to some dango when we get Mr. Future Hokage-sama in return for me not blabbing. Suck my balls. Daiki rolled his eyes and flipped her the bird. Sure, but after the dango... Anko's smirk widened as she spread her coat and cupped her huge racks in her hands and jiggled them invitingly in her hands. Want a titty shaboink to go with it? The distance between the hidden leaf village and the hidden mist village was roughly 3,500 miles. That was a larger distance than America was wide. Then again, the land of fire was one of the bigger countries, granted not the biggest, but it was still bigger than America itself. Frankly, it was a good thing. If there weren't such massive distances between the great five shinobi villages, 
tensions would be much higher and there would have probably been more than just three great shinobi wars. Flight made the trip oh so much easier. Not because of the distance, but because it made it easier to avoid foreign ninja guarding borders and such. Especially since with the Shinkigan he could catch sight of any well in advance and change directions or altitude as needed to avoid them. They left the land of waves behind quickly, briefly re-entered the land of fire once more passing by, and before long they were into the brief stretch of mainland that was once in possession of the hidden whirlpool. Their main territory was in the middle of the ocean on a large island protected by natural whirlpool formations, but they did also have a stretch of mainland given to them by the Senju where non-Uzumaki resided. Only those of Uzumaki descent or those who married into the clan were allowed to live on the main island from what Daiki had learned when looking into them during his studies on sealing. Though it was less to do with something like thinking they were better than those not part of their lineage, or any xenophobia or anything and more to do with the fact that it was simply safer. The Uzumaki for the most part weren't far off of the Kagaya clan in temperament. They were utter barbaric blood knights, just stupidly smart ones on top of that. To be honest they just sounded like angrier, more educated redhead Naruto's. Naruto would be the calm, polite one of his clan. And to be fair, when one was as skilled with Fuinjutsu as the Uzumaki were supposed to be, it was hard not to go a little crazy. Daiki could attest to that himself. Putting them aside, why haven't we reclaimed this land ourselves? Daiki thought with a frown as they soared over the land main land itself. From a brief examination as he flew, it was a rather large area, bigger than a lot of countries from his other life, and the land was ripe with lush vegetation and healthy land. Not to mention it was annexed between the land of fire, the land of waves and the ocean itself. The only ones who could reliably attack it were the Mist Village. Maybe because there isn't any lands with Shinobi here to work as a border again enemies. He mused. The land of loot stood between the land of fire and the land of wind. The land of grass and waterfall stood between fire and stone. And the land of frost and what would become the land of sound but was currently tea country blocked them off from the land of lightning. And, formerly this land and whirlpool stood between the land of fire and water. Honestly, it was a genius positioning. That was one thing he did have to hand to Hashirama and Madara, they picked an incredibly defendable area to build Kanoha. But Whirlpool were gone, there was nobody who had authority over those lands now. It was such a waste of land that could be used to expand industry for the good of the village. If they could turn the whole swath of land into farmland and other such necessities, it would massively increase Kanoha's standing even further. Sure there was some risk of mist before, but the place had been left untouched nearly since the Second Great Shinobi War, the benefit far outweighed any risk of mist attacking, and in fact would actually present a ripe spot to target to keep mist busy if they ever did, claiming such an abundant land assuming another war broke out. Daiki couldn't understand why the old man hadn't retaken it with the Uzumaki gone. Unless it's sentimentality, and he's not reclaiming it as honor to the Uzumaki and our alliance? He hoped not. That would be dumb. Actually, to be quite frank, as far as Daiki was concerned. With Wave not having a ninja village either, he'd see about expanding into there as well. And cut off any stupid little punk-ass biatch like Gato trying to operate out of there again. Thoughts for later. He thought. Better left for when he consulted the old man about it and those whose actual job it was to keep track of lands. And when he could actually start putting plans in motion as the Hokage especially if he could confirm the alliance with Mist. Before long, they had completely cleared the former mainland belonging to the former Hidden Whirlpool village and were out over open water. And it wasn't long before massive whirlpools began to desecrate the surface of the ocean. Damn! Anko whistled, overlooking them wide-eyed. And he didn't blame her. There were hundreds of them, each easily a hundred feet wide in all directions and churning with such force, just one would surely suck in and decimate even larger cruiser battleships. They decorated the horizon of the ocean for multiple miles, side to side in a curving manner that seemed to be going in a circular shape. Frankly, he doubted any standard genin could get past those whirlpools even with water walking, and even most chunin would struggle. That can't be natural. He shook his head. It ain't? Anko shrugged, looking away from the water to look him in the eye. Orochimaru told me once the Uzumaki did it themselves with seals, how I've got no idea, but that's all man-made kid.
It was tempting to see about looking down into the depths of the ocean to see if he could make them out with the Shinkigan and study them. But they'd already wasted a day with what he pulled with the Kubikura Bocho, and unlike with that, he wasn't exactly on a time limit of a sort and could always come back this way to check them out. Besides, if he couldn't find them from the surface with the Shinkigan, he'd probably need to assume Bijou mode and dive into the depths of the ocean itself and search them out. He put them out for the mind for the moment and pushed one, glowing wings of green chakra propelling them through the air over the massive amount of whirlpools and before long, a large island came into view. An island easily the size of a small country, filled with lush green nature, large twisting rivers and lakes, and the ruins of a once thriving civilization. The ruins of buildings were clear in view, huge, sturdy buildings reminiscent of buildings from his other life, much more advanced than any in Kanoha or any other village he'd been in, even once massive and sprawling skyscrapers lay in ruins. It really was amazing how advanced the Uzumaki were. Society and technology-wise, they had to have been ahead of everyone else by a good 30 or 40 year at least. He wouldn't be surprised if they had already devised supercomputers, laptops, Wi-Fi and other such technical marvels. If only this world wasn't basically in a constant state of war and death and the Uzumaki had shared their technology. This world would probably be way more advanced than the world of his other self. And he probably wouldn't need to make a trip to the land of Moon just to get his hands on a damn gaming console. Which he still needed to do. Honestly, why was he so goddamn busy all the damn tea? Hmm. Daiki halted suddenly mid-air as he caught something in his peripheral gaze. What's the deal, brat? Anko asked, furrowing her brows. He turned around mid-air towards what he saw and nodded his head in the direction. There's somebody down there, he said. Where? I can't see him. Anko narrowed her eyes in the direction. They're a few miles off, Daiki explained his eyes narrowing as he focused his vision to zoom in on the figure he saw. I only noticed because they've got a ton of chakra. Actually, there were two figures with chakra, both quite potent, though one more than the other. Otherwise, without focusing specifically in that direction, he wouldn't have noticed the guy. As his vision zoomed in on the man until it was like he was standing right in front of him, his features came into view. He was tall and burly, with dark tan skin and burnt blonde, almost orange hair, beady little pale green eyes, and a bushy beard of the same color of his hair and a tousled mustache. He seemed to be in about his late twenties give or take a few years, dressed in plain pants and boots, and was shirtless beyond a small unbuttoned vest. And there was a shinobi headband around his forehead, a mist forehead protector to be exact, with a slash through it. How much chakra are we talking here? Enko asked. About the same as you. Daiki replied. His focus wasn't really on the man though. Rather, it was the weapon on his back, a spear of some sort. Though not any spear he'd ever seen. The long shaft of it was made of crimson red metal, and the spear tip wasn't so much the tip of a spear as it was the face of some sort of fish, a swordfish maybe? It was bone white, with a long spear or sword-like nose. And it contained a vast amount of chakra. More than the man carrying it, more even than Daiki himself. He narrowed his eyes a little bit more, and he peered straight into the weapon itself. And then his eyes widened at what he saw. Seals. Specifically seals in the same style of the Kubikurabocho and the Kiba blades. Though, even with his advanced knowledge of seals, he could only see that part of the makeup of the seals within were geared towards absorbing chakra. It was similar to the seals that allowed for chakra absorption within his chakra armor, but more advanced. But the greater whole actually reminded him more of a seal used to seal away a bijou, like his four symbol seal. He let Anko know of the man's description. A pretty strong missing ninja from mist then. Huh? Anko hummed and reached into her coat. A second later bringing out her hand with a bingo book in hand and quickly opened it up and flipping through it. Let's see. Blonde, blonde, blonde. She muttered, flipping through the pages at a rapid rate. She stopped a moment later and held up a page. This him? She asked. Daiki looked at the image, before nodding. Yeah, that's him. An A-rank missing ninja then. His name is Arami Fanato. Anko hummed, thoughtfully reading his information off of the page. Says he was a candidate for the seven ninja swordsmen of the mist. A backup wielder for Samahata, whatever that is. 
He went rogue apparently after Kisame Hashigake and losing his chance to wield the sword and killed a bunch of his comrades on the way out. He even has a bloodline apparently. What kind? Daiki raised an eyebrow. He'd never heard of a Fanato clan before. Power of the Sea Dragon it's called. Anko shrugged. Seems to give him an amped water affinity, making his water jutsu stronger. Let him breathe underwater and even freely control standing bodies of water without having to shape it into a jutsu or anything. That was a really cool sounding bloodline, though it clearly had nothing to do with dragons. Obviously it was just named that because it sounded cool or powerful. It also explained how this guy managed to get to the island. Let's kill him. Daiki decided after a moment. Okay. I'm all for it. Anko smirked. Though, we are on a pretty important mission right now, brat. I hope you remember that. Oh, I know. Daiki smirked back. I'm just thinking. Bringing them the head of one of their higher-ranked missing ninja will also be another point in our favor for the negotiations. Especially since he's technically trespassing on our allies' land, and by proxy hours. Also, he wanted that spear thing he had. He wanted to study those seals. And he could even give it to Ten Ten or somebody who could use it well. Well, sound logic I suppose. Anko snorted. Then how do you want to go about this? We're far enough away that I doubt he's noticed us at all. He definitely hasn't. I'd notice if he did. Daiki replied. For one the man hadn't even turned in their direction at all and for another. His chakra network was completely calm. He didn't seem alert at all. Though just to be sure. He focused chakra into his eyes. And a moment later a familiar shimmering red dust swarmed around him and Anko both, seeping into them. The heck was that? Anko asked. One of the abilities of my eyes, it allows me to completely hide chakra signatures. Daiki replied, his mind going through how he should approach this situation. Even someone with the Byakugan wouldn't be able to see our chakra now even if we were standing right in front of them. Holy crap, really? Anko's eyes widened in shock and she outright goggled at him. That's absurd. I've never even heard of something like that before. Do you know how easy that would be assassinating people? Very, Daiki grinned. It's one of the reasons the old man picked me to become the Godame Hokage. With these eyes, I could literally waltz into other villages completely undetected, transform into my full bijou state and unleash a bijudama right in the middle of their villages and completely cripple them. Ha! Huh. Anko blinked. You know, you did mention something like that before when you were talking crap to Elder Shimura. But when you get to the actual brass tacks of it, kid you're terrifying. As the Hokage should be. Daiki nodded, pleased. He let that hang for a moment before shrugging. Anyway, I kinda wanna go down there and take him on face to face, he admitted. It would be a good test of where I stand right now to fight him to the death without using my Jinchuriki abilities. That's dumb, Anko snorted. I'm all for a good fight and all kid, but you don't play around with guys like this. Especially when you don't plan on going all out. Even for you if you don't take him seriously there's a good chance you'd get killed. Nah, I'd win. Daiki refuted. To doubt his ability to handle a guy like this, after everything he'd done, after everything he'd gotten his hands on, and all the absurd backbreaking training he'd done, breaking himself over and over again every day multiple times a day without the help of Isabu, would be proof he'd never have what it takes to stand at the top of this world. That wasn't him. He was the one chosen to become the fifth Hokage, the leader of the most powerful military force in this world. It was merely a matter of if he could defeat this guy head-on without resorting to his heavenly star seal or not. Cocky brat. Anko snorted and rolled her eyes. Either way, the mission comes first. It's more important than you going down there, and swinging your oversized meat grinder around and strutting about like the cock of the walk. Well, she wasn't wrong. Fine. Fine. Daiki bowed to her wisdom and lowered them down through the air until they landed atop one of the massive building structures of the former Whirlpool Village. Good to see you can see reason sometimes, kid. Anko nodded approvingly. I say we stealth him. With our chakra hidden, it'll be a cakewalk to get close to this guy and then finish him off. Maybe... Daiki crossed his arms and nodded. Though he has some form of sentient weapon of some kind that seems to be able to absorb chakra, a lot like Samahata. Anko blinked and gave him an odd look. And how can you tell? She asked. There was nothing like that written in the bingo book. And unless he's playing fetch with the damn thing, I don't see how you can know that just from looking at him. I can see the seals inside the weapon. 
They're mostly geared towards absorbing chakra. I'm quite familiar with them, Daiki explained. That, and there's another seal that's quite similar to one used to seal Bijou in a Jinchuriki. From what I'm guessing, there's a soul of some sort within the weapon. Honestly, using it as a basis, he was thinking Samahara was created through something similar. What exactly was used to give it sentience, though he wondered? A human soul? An animal's soul? He was quite interested to find out. While the spear or harpoon thing wasn't really his type of weapon and would be better suited to Tenten, that didn't mean he didn't plan on learning all he could from it. And if sealing souls inside a weapon could make them more powerful or not. Plus, didn't that kind of make that spear thing and Samahata, if he was right, almost like a Zampakuto? Could he seal a soul inside the Kiba blades? Man, those eyes are funky. Anko shook her head. Still, that doesn't really change anything. Sentient weapon that absorbs chakra or not, it's useless if we slit his throat before he can even pull it out. True. Daiki nodded before smirking. But who says we even need to move from right here? The fact that we're miles away from him? Anko raised an eyebrow as if she was pointed out the obvious. Which fair, usually she would be. I want to try something, he said simply. Really not the time to be experiment brat. Anko rolled her eyes. Fine, but if whatever you're planning fails, I want you to go full force so we can take this guy out quickly, bijou power and all. All right, Daiki agreed. That was fair. Then have at it. Anko waved her arm in the direction where Arami Fanato was casually going about his business, completely unaware of their presence. Stepping forward, Daiki clenched his fists and focused for a moment and a second later. A crackling aura of pure lightning erupted from his Tenketsu and enveloped his body as he entered his lightning chakra mode. Ho! Anko hummed with interest as Daiki brought his hands up. Many ninjutsu were long range, but not a whole lot of them had such a range they could hit a target from miles away, and most that could tended to be the type that wrought massive amounts of destruction. Even for Daiki, he had precious few jutsu that could hit a target from as far away as he was with any semblance of accuracy. He did have one though that was fast, powerful, and easy to aim. In fact, it was perhaps the most accurate jutsu he knew that existed, simply because with enough control over it, the user could change its direction mid-flight. One that was also a true blue lightning jutsu, as in one that had all the speed of a real lightning bolt, unlike say his electromagnetic murder which was much slower. His fingers blurred as he ran through a series of hand seals before pulling his hands apart and lifting his right arm, two fingers pointing out towards his target. Electric buzzed and warped around his fingers as pure lightning chakra compressed along the length of his two digits. The lightning around his fingers shimmered and faded from bright light blue to a gleaming white. Lightning style. False darkness. Daiki declared, and from his finger a massive spear of lightning erupted and streaked through the sky. It crossed the miles of distance between him and his target in all the time it took to blink. Arami Fanato had his back turned to them, and with his chakra signature completely hidden by the Shinkigan and didn't even have the chance to sense it coming, never mind see it. The spear of crackling white lightning slammed into his back and pierced straight through his heart, tearing a hole straight through his torso in one smooth motion before continuing on and streaking off into the distance and disappearing from even the range of his Shinkigan in moments. And a second later, the corpse of his target dropped face first onto the ground. The missing ninja probably didn't even have time to understand or process what happened, and died without ever knowing he was under attack. Daiki stared at the corpse of his target for a moment, analyzing him with his dojitsu, just to make sure he was really dead before nodding to himself a moment later, pleased. He dispersed his lightning chakra mode, allowing the crackling lightning chakra around his body to fizzle out and turn to Anko with a big grin. Well, that was easy. Anko blinked. He's dead? She gaped at him. Yup. Thanks to my chakra being hidden and the speed of my jutsu, he had no chance to react and defend himself. Daiki replied, proudly crossing his arms especially thanks to the fact that his lightning style, false darkness jutsu was massively amplified thanks to his lightning chakra mode. It was usually a B-rank jutsu, but when amplified by the lightning chakra mode, it was actually more like an A-rank jutsu. It was comparable actually to the Chidori in strength. 
and didn't come with that annoyingly loud chirping screeching noise Kakashi's favorite assassination jutsu came with, and you know, could be fired from long range. Not that Chidori was a bad jutsu or anything, it would be amazing to use in tandem with his lightning chakra mode in an up-close battle. Kid what the hell? You are terrifying. Anko's jaw dropped. Did you seriously just assassinate an A-rank shinobi from miles away in seconds? Looks like it. Daiki beamed. He was extremely pleased with himself. Was he the first sniper of the elemental nations? Probably not, but he'd claim so anyway. Or at the very least the best. I'm not even sure what to say that. That's just impressive as hell. Anko ran a hand through her hair and shook her head after regaining her composure. Honestly, I'll say one thing, it sure ain't ever boring being around you kid. One he was done preening at Anko's shock and awe of his newly gained sniping skills. She and Daiki made their way over to where the corpse resided. Damn. Anko whistled as they approached and saw the massive gaping hole piercing through his back. To do this to an A-rank guy with one jutsu from that far, that's unreal brat. Wait. Daiki stopped and held out a hand in front of Anko, stopping her from approaching the body. Wait. WH Anko began to ask, but was cut off by a snarling howl escaping from the thin maw of the fish-headed spear resting atop the corpse's back. Its pale white bone eyes lit up with a crimson glow and before their eyes, the fine-headed fish spear tip seemed to explode in size, spear nose doubling in size, its back erupting into dozens of razor-sharp edges, its fins stretching out and becoming razor-sharp, spoiler, and then the spear itself, maw opening and bearing razor-sharp teeth flipped up from the corpse's back and launched itself at them with a savage howl. Before it could reach them though, Daiki blurred forward, his hand catching it around its maw and slamming its jaw shut tightly with raw physical strength alone. Nice try, but I've already saw this crap with Samahata. Daiki snorted, even as it snarled and howled in his grip, jerking with all its might to try and free itself. Unfortunately for it, it was spear, or rather now that he was closer, looked more like a harpoon. But either way, unlike Samahata, its weapon body was a lot more rigid with a lot less bend to it. What the absolute hell? Enko cursed. Told you it was sentient. Daiki teased. It growled in his grasp, but didn't give up. In fact, its struggles renewed a moment later as green chakra began to seep out of Daiki's hand and be drawn into the tiny gaps it was able to open its mouth to with its struggles. It was absorbing his chakra. It was actually quite an impressive amount. But in the end, nice try you dumbass swordfish, Daiki laughed at it. But you'll be here all week before you can suck out all my chakra, he taunted it, before it disappeared as he sucked it inside the dimension force seal on his palm. Pretty sure it's a marlin actually, Enko pointed out drilly. Dumbass marlin then, Daiki corrected, making his way over to the body and summoning one of the kiba blades from his seal. Wait! Isabu spoke up before he could swing the blade and lop the head off of the corpse. What's up? Daiki paused and asked. This man's bloodline. Look at his neck, it has a physical manifestation. Isabu said. Doing as his inner turtle demon said. Daiki examined the man's neck and his eyes widened at what he saw. Black gills. Well, they looked like they were supposed to be gills, but rather than actual physical gills, it looked like gills made of black ink. Almost like sealing ink. Yes. Isabu nodded. This power of the sea dragon as it's called. It's a viable candidate for your bloodline usurpation seal. When it's finished at least. It's hardly the most powerful bloodline out there. But it will be helpful at least. Well alright then. Adjusting his aim. Daiki swung his blade and cut the head clean off the corpse at the very tip of the neck. Avoiding the black tattoo like gills. He sealed the head inside his dimension force seal before looking the body over for anything of note. Barely anything beyond some rations. Not even any money. This guy is a total Scrooge. Daiki scoffed. Just as he was finishing patting the corpse down, he found a small sealing scroll in the man's back pocket. He opened it up, before rolling his eyes when he saw how low quality it was. It would barely have as much storage as a large closet. Hell, this wouldn't even go for 10,000 Rio back home in Kanoha. Daiki rolled his eyes and pulsed his chakra through the scroll and examined the contents. His scan told him there were only two items within the ceiling scroll. Well, whatever. 
He unsealed them with a pulse of chakra, and in a puff of smoke another small scroll appeared. Alongside, a large bone white bow in the shape of a manta ray. His eyes widened immediately at what he saw. Just like the marlin, harpoon thing, the inside of the bow was filled to the brim with seals. Only, this one was with seals he'd never even seen before. A cursory glance and his current knowledge let him deduce they amplified chakra in a way, similar in a way to the Kiba blades but wholly different. Well now, wasn't this another good find? What luck! The marlin harpoon and the ray bow. Well, looks like Anko was right about what it was based on at least. Daiki mused not long later as they once again soared through the skies towards their destination. He had one arm wrapped around Anko, while in the other he had the unfurled form of the small scroll he found in Arami Funato sealing scroll alongside the large bone white bow. It was a scroll that went into the creation and functions of the pair of weapons, and just who they actually were made by and for. Apparently, according to the scroll they were created by the head of the Uzumaki clan over 50 years ago, actually apparently it was nearly a hundred years ago both weapons were created. Made by one Erisher, the Blood Chain Storm, Uzumaki. Former head of the Uzumaki clan and the creator of both weapons. What kind of Chiyuni ass name is Blood Chain Storm? Daiki snorted to himself. Then again it kind of fit for someone of the Uzumaki clan. According to Kushina, the entire clan might have been the absolute pinnacle of genius when it came to the sealing arts and had the most advanced civilization by far in this world from what he'd seen. That they might have been, but they were all also barbarian blood knight adrenaline junkie freaks of nature. Like the Kagaya clan, except way more powerful and not anywhere near as retarded. Just autistic as all hell. The autisticiest honestly. Who the hell sealed the god of death in a mask? Like where did they even come up with such an idea? And how did they even accomplish it? For one thing they were the ones who made the reaper death seal, so they were the ones who originally had to have summoned the god of death from what? The afterlife. Some other dimension. And then they just boxed his butt up? Absolutely wild. Well either way, moving on beyond that, both weapons were indeed created by a former head of the Uzumaki clan. The Ray Bao, the weaker and less useful of the two as stated by Erishiru Uzumaki in the scroll detailing their creation and purpose, had quite a few abilities. The main ability of the Ray Bao was for the user to inject a tiny amount of chakra into it and then have that chakra be amplified massively and could then be formed into a physical shape of pure chakra energy. In the case of the Bao, the seal work on it made it so that the chakra was formed into an arrow. It didn't have to just be a small bit of chakra though, that was just an example. Apparently, it could handle and amplify a lot of chakra. As in, it could create arrows the size of buildings, no sweat. That alone was incredible. But it didn't end there. No, because the Ray Bao had a few others' abilities. For one, when it pierced a target, it pulsed chakra from the arrow it made erratically through the chakra network of the target and heavily disrupted their chakra network. Even just grazing them could mess over someone's chakra network for a decent while. The amplified chakra arrows also apparently were paralytic. The bow itself added a paralytic enchantment, sealed a paralytic effect into the chakra itself. Oh, and apparently the user of the bow could even change the trajectory of the arrows fired with the bow itself. It was an absolutely busted weapon. But apparently it was just the weaker of the two weapons when it came to regarding the marlin harpoon, which was specifically stated right away in the scroll to be a failure. That was wild. Incredibly absolutely wild. From a cursory glance, the weapon did exactly as he knew from examining its seals. It absorbed chakra, a lot of it. That was its most basic function. What he wasn't quite expecting though was what else he read. The Marlin Harpoon had its own chakra system sealed within it. Or rather, it had a beast of notable power sealed within and bound to the harpoon itself as if it were its body. The boss of the Marlin Summoning Clan. In Erishiru Uzumaki's pursuit to create the ultimate and sentient weapon with the ability to sense chakra, absorb chakra and protect its wielder, he entered into a contract with the Marlin Summoning Clan and promised the boss of the Summoning Clan eternal life in the form of the Marlin Harpoon. The Marlin Harpoon had all the strength and chakra capacity of a high-tier summon boss, but was deemed a failure because the creation of the Harpoon itself was flawed and too rigid and thus limited the boss within the spear unless it was attacking straight head-on. 
Thus, both the Marlin Harpoon and the Ray Bow for some reason were scrapped as projects after being completed. There was a little tidbit at the end though that had Daiki raising his eyebrows. I have learned from my mistakes. I will not make them again. Next time, I will create the ultimate unbeatable weapon that even the Bijou themselves will fear. I call it Project Samahata. Well now, wasn't that interesting to know? It all but confirmed that indeed the Uzumaki clan created the Seven Blades of the Mist. Honestly, it makes me wonder how that guy even found these. Was he grave robbing or something? Daiki wondered. But they were obviously well hidden to some degree otherwise they would have been found long ago and taken. Failures the creator might have called them, but they were obviously better weapons than at least half of the Seven Swords of the Mist. Honestly, considering Erishiru Uzumaki called the Ray Bao and Marlin Harpoon failures, beyond the Kiba Blades and Samahata, it wouldn't surprise him if the other five were just random weapons members of the Uzumaki clan had for their rank and file, and not actually anything that special. Well, maybe not Kubikirabocho, simple as it was in effect, it was incredibly useful. Actually considering how the Uzumaki clan seemed, Kubikirabocho might have been designed just to farm chakra or like he planned to do and was never intended to be a weapon and was just designed like a massive buster sword because the Uzumaki were crazy. Either way, Daiki didn't really care all that much. Rather, he was focused on something much more interesting. Specifically, the chakra amplification effect of the Ray Bao and its ability to change the trajectory of chakra it fired as arrows. Those would be incredibly useful to add to his Kiba blades. But beyond even that was the idea of copying what Erishir Uzumaki did and sealing a powerful entity of some sort into the blades. Maybe one of the other? No. Isabu crushed that thought before he even finished it. You are not sealing any of my siblings into a pair of swords. For one, we don't have bodies like a summoning boss does. Secondly, you would make the blades their new bodies, so no, not happening. Well, fair enough. What about the Zero Tails? He asked. He actually already had a rough idea where to find that thing, and had simply been holding off for a while. Actually, he was more interested in the old schmuck of a villain after the Zero Tails and his bodybuilding jutsu rather than the Zero Tails itself. He'd been holding off going there for now, though. I refuse. Isabu huffed immediately. Daiki blinked. The fact it is referred to as the Zero Tails, as if it were part of our family, is outrageous. Isabu spat and Daiki was astounded by the vitriol from his usually very calm, mellow buddy. It's a leech that escaped from hell hundreds of years ago when the Uzumaki clan were playing around with going to hell like it was a vacation spot. It has no desire of its own. It is simply a leech that feeds on negative emotions. It is the literal exact thing people paint we bijou as a mindless chakra beast. The Uzumaki clan again? What the hell was up with that clan? You'd be surprised. Isabu snorted. They're the literal reason most demons made it to this world in the first place. In fact, if I'm not wrong, that one you plan to steal the little stone golem army off of is one that escaped because of them. Ha! Huh. What the hell? Uzumaki clan? Well, I suppose I'll have to deal with that thing in the future as well. Daiki shook his head. It was a shame because the Zero Tails, while ugly and disgusting, could be very useful. I didn't say you couldn't make use of it in some form, just that I don't want my Jinchuriki associating with it at all. Isabu sighed. Honestly, if I were you, I'd help that Karama clan girl, Yakumo, was it? Tame the Ito with your sealing abilities and then seal the leech inside her. With the way her bloodline works, it would passively generate dark chakra in a perpetual cycle and be much safer than what that old fool was trying to do with it. Oh, huh, he'd completely forgotten about Yakumo. But that wasn't a bad idea at all, actually. It did leave the question, though, just what he could see inside his Kiba blades. But he had time to think on that later. Daiki had plenty to think about along the continued trip towards the Mist Village. Though, in the grand scheme of things, without any more interruptions, it didn't take all that long before they arrived. Or reached within a decent distance of the village at least. When the Mist Village appeared on the horizon, he could see it much more in detail and clearly thanks to his eyes. Honestly, it looked to be quite the dreary place. The large island amongst the archipelago it was situated on, was full of large roving green hills, mountainous even, with large jutting mountainous pillars of earth dotting the landscape as far as the eye could see, rising high enough to pierce the clouds. The architecture of the village itself was a bit odd to Daiki as well. He hadn't exactly studied architectural techniques and all. Yet. But, 
Every building he could see of small size like a house or factory building lacking in height was completely circular, while other larger buildings that rose high into the air were cylindrical in build. At the very center of the village was a huge circular building sitting atop a sloped brick structure that had many tens of dozens of pathways spread throughout the village, and atop most of the buildings were greenery, grass, trees, and more. Such an oddly built village. Daiki thought as he descended through the air a few miles away from the village, landing atop the ocean and letting Anko down. Who came up with such a design, and what purpose did it have he wondered? Finally, Anko breathed a sigh of relief and stretched out her arms. Flying is cool and all kid, but it got boring real fast with nothing to do. Daiki just shrugged. He'd had plenty to do over the past day and plenty more to think about. Such was the benefit of being one on the one true path of the holy grind though. Anyway, focus up kid. Anko said suddenly, we're about to enter the home of the succubus. So seal away your meat grinder for a little while, will you? Seriously, he was not that bad. Even if they were mostly joking. Sure, he'd been flirting a lot lately. But that was simply because of how little he needed to focus during the Chunin exams and how bored he'd been. He wasn't going to let his meat lead him during something as serious as meeting with a foreign kage no matter how hot. Yeah, yeah. Daiki rolled his eyes and began walking across the ocean towards their destination. The entrance to the hidden village in the mist, if it could really technically be called that, was a port. Unlike Kanoha that was completely surrounded by large walls, the mist village was technically the entire island. There was a large circular building spread out around the port, and quite a few ships were docked there as well. It made sense, as a village of the land of water and their territory being an archipelago of islands, that most of their trade and clients would come by ways of seafaring. A glance with the Shinkigan was all it took to confirm the contents of the buildings at the port, the vast majority of them being storage buildings, which again made sense, one larger spherical building stood out though. From peering inside it, he could see it was an administrational building of some sort, and he was sure he even saw a mission room quite like the one back in Kanoha. Kanoha Shinobi, a man dressed in the dark blue padded mist tuning gear addressed them as they made land on the port. You're a long way from home. He stated in lieu of greeting, his eyes eyeing the headband tied around Daiki's waist like a belt suspiciously. Are we really though? Daiki resisted the urge to snort. He could be back home in an hour or two easily if he really wanted to gun it back. Daiki eyed Anko from the corner of his eye, but she didn't say a thing. She only raised an eyebrow at him. Yeah, he was in charge of this mission in totality, it seemed. And honestly, a little bit of thought into her presence on this mission told him she wasn't just his babysitter and backup. She was evaluating him and would be reporting his performance back to Old Man Third, which probably also meant everything he'd done up until now, from his actions taking Kubikura Bocho, what he told her about it, him killing that missing ninja and of course what he'd do here at the Mist Village. Honestly, that was fine with him. Time to turn on that charm. That we are my friend. Daiki gave the Miss Chunin a winning, debonairly handsome smile. My name is Daiki. Daiki Yuriai. You might have heard of me, or you will at least in the future if you haven't yet. I and my beautiful companion are envoys of the leaf and are here to meet with the Mizukic. He bowed his head ever so slightly respectfully while maintaining eye contact. Nailed it. And then he peered straight into the man's mind. Damn leaf hippies. Look at this hoity-toity rich-looking little schmucker. Probably never worked a hard day in his life. The man snorted derisively within the safety of his mind. Isabu snorted. Daiki just maintained his winning smile. If this goes through in sours, he dies first. He thought. I see, then wait here. I will announce your arrival to my superiors. The Miss Chunin said aloud, turning away and as he did, Daiki stared straight through his torso and saw him making a single hand seal though it was not one for molding chakra. He left a moment later, leaving both him and Anko on the port, but all around him he could feel eyes on them. Umbu, Anko noted, crossing her arms. Yeah, that would do it. They were pretty well hidden to the naked eye. Too bad for them, he had the shink again. Twelve of them. Daiki nodded. He didn't call his dojitsu the all-seeing scarlet eye for no reason after all. A standard full platoon then, probably a usual guard for their port. Enko hummed. That made sense. Them, alongside the multitude of Chunin in the dozens spread throughout the port buildings working in the buildings and on guard, 
meant they had quite a decently large force protecting their port at all times. His eyes flickered up, peering into the sky above, where he could see a large thin dome of chakra that encapsulated the entirety of the island. A sensory barrier just like Kanoha's. It was bigger than Kanoha's, yet thinner. It would cost quite a hefty amount of chakra to maintain such a barrier, and the Mist Village weren't well known for their chakra powerhouses beyond the odd one here and there. Kiri was more known for its weapon wielders. Such a barrier could never sense him if he was trying to hide. And in fact, despite its size, would be a liability in trying to sense someone within populated areas. That size, from what he could tell with his eyes sacrifice quality for range. He supposed he could understand, they had to monitor the entirety of their territory and a few concessions had to be made. Note to self, when I become Hokage I need to see about making sure our barrier core are up to snuff. Daiki thought, perhaps he could look into using the chakra amplification seal once he mastered it himself, to augment the machines the barrier core used to create, maintain and use the village sensory barrier. Actually, that brought up the question of what he should do with the Ray Bao once he was done with it. He had no need for it personally. The Marlin Harpoon was going to 10-10 of course. But the Ray Bao, he wasn't sure if he should give it to her. Sure, she was probably the best marksman in his generation and probably actually one of the best in the village despite her age. But, with the sheer range of the Ray Bao from his estimates and its versatility, it would make a mean combo with the Byakugan. Sure, the Byakugan was inferior to his Shinkigan, but its range was still far beyond anybody else's when it came to length of sight and as such, had much more potential with such a weapon for attacking from incredibly long ranges. So a Hyuga, which meant Hanabi or Hinata. Hinata was a cool girl, and she was doing way better now than herself from the other timeline, and the Ray Bao would really be a big help to her. And she was a good friend. But, Hanabi was his apprentice, his student, his shoulder lowly minion of Epic Doom. And she was younger, so her fighting style had more room for things to be added in compared to Hinata who was turning 15 soon, a full year or so older than him. Actually, it's my birthday soon. Daiki blinked and realized. He'd completely forgotten. In fact, it was Naruto's birthday tomorrow, October 10th, and then his was November 1st. He'd be turning 14 in three weeks, a little after the Chunin exams ended. Neat. If he became Hokage after the Chunin exams, and after he became 14, would that make him the youngest Kage ever? Old man Sarutobi became Hokage when he was like 16 or 17. And Gara, of course hadn't become the Kazakage in this timeline yet. And he didn't even know if he would really. Well, whatever it didn't really matter right now. And he could think later on just who would be better to give the Ray Bao to going forward. Besides, he could probably make one if he wanted in the future once he had mastered the seals inscribed within. Better even considering his plans when it came to chakra or... Which really brought up the question just why the Marlin Harpoon and Ray Bao weren't made of chakra or to begin with, because there should be no problem doing so. But whatever. Look alive kid. Looks like a big shot is coming out to get us. Anko said, nudging him on the shoulder. I know, I saw him or rather them. Daiki shrugged. His mind might be wandering, but his eyes weren't. Two people were making a beeline towards them. Chakra capacity-wise, they both stood ahead above anyone else in the port, including the hidden Umbu. One of them had nearly as much chakra as Anko, while the other had a little bit below. The stronger of the two chakra capacity-wise was a man of average height and slim build, dressed in a blue kimono-like outfit, with dark blue hair and a single eye patch over one of his eyes, while the other was a younger man, a bit shorter than Daiki himself with a lean build, light blue hair and rectangular glasses, twin hilts jutting from a bandage encased item atop his back. Ao and Chojuro, huh? Daiki mused inwardly. The two hands of the Mizukage, more or less from what he knew and the Chosen Guards may had during the Five Kage Summit in the other timeline. One a wielder of a stolen Byakugan, the other the only remaining loyal member of the Seven Ninja Swordsmen of the Mist and the wielder of Hiramakarii, the Great Twin Blades. Daiki's eyes were on Chijuro as the two approached, or rather he peered straight through the older boy and was examining the blades atop his back. To his disappointment, while like the Kiba blades and Kubikirabocho, they were engraved with many seals within, it wasn't any seals he hadn't already seen before. In fact, it was the same chakra amplification seal within the Ray Bao, 
and a similar yet inferior chakra shaping seal that allowed the Ray Bao to manifest chakra as energy physical arrows, which actually put it below the Ray Bao in terms of seal work. Well, that sucks. Daiki clicked his tongue. But he supposed not everything was going to be a way for him to improve. It also once again highlighted the fact that another of the seven ninja swordsman's weapons were definitely of Uzumaki make. And that would be incredibly useful going forward with these negotiations. After all, as Naruto was a part of Konoha and Konoha was the only ally of the Uzumaki, they were the ones with a real claim to the blades. It most certainly wouldn't amount to much beyond a chance to levy some allegations if it came to it. But it was a little bit more leverage to use if he so needed. Negotiations he was assuming were a lot like a fight. Whoever had the bigger muscles or in this case the more leverage won. Moments later the pair arrived in front of Daiki and Enko. Envoys of the Leaf Village. Welcome to the village hidden in the mist. Eo greeted them. His singular eye momentarily narrowing ever so slightly as he took in Daiki's form. H hello. I am Chijuro and this is Eo. We will be escorting you to Mizukich-sama. Chojuro nervously added as a greeting. A pleasure. Daiki gave them his infamous debonairly handsome smile that made babies smile, rainbows form and even reformed the most evil and heinous of all bad guys. I am Daiki Yuriai and this is my bodyguard Anko. He introduced himself and the woman who was accompanying him. He saw Chojuro's eyes widen ever so slightly at his reply and could practically read his mind without even using the Shinkigen. So young. Ao's mouth twitched a bit downwards, but he stopped it immediately from forming the frown or perhaps scowl it was destined to become upon descent. Him being sent by Old Man Third when it was obviously so young probably rankled him. After all, he was a back-in-my-day boomer kind of guy from what he remembered, which usually and hilariously tended to make him trigger Mei Terumi's Christmas cake age related trauma and piss her off. I didn't expect the envoy of Kanoha to be so young. Ao literally floundered for a moment trying to word his statement in a way that wasn't outright insulting because of his age. Heh. Well you know us Kanoha guys. Daiki shrugged. Winning smile still spread across his face. We're well known for our young, absurdly powerful and incredibly virile and handsome prodigies. We're just built different. I see. Ao replied. Looking like he just bit into a lemon. After a moment or two. Eo managed to hide his grouchy old man emotions once more and gestured for them to follow him. Please follow us, Mizukage sama is expecting you, he said. Let on. Daiki continued to give a blindingly bright and full of good intentions, debonairly handsome, inviting good guy smile. That doesn't even make sense. Isabu snorted. It did to him, which was all that really mattered in the end. Eo nodded once, tersely before turning on his heel and walking away. What a testy old man. Well, he could work with that. So Chojuro, Daiki casually fell in line with the older blue-haired boy and struck up conversation. You're a member of the Seven Ninja Swordsmen then, that's impressive. Eh, uh, and no not really I still have a long way tea to go until I catch up to my predecessors. The older boy replied sheepishly, rubbing the back of his head nervously. You're pretty young though and already been chosen to wield Hiramakarii. Daiki pointed out. That's pretty impressive, he praised. Aha, you think? The older boy flushed at the praise. Somebody needed to get this guy laid. It would do wonders for that timid personality. Definitely, Daiki continued smiling. I'm quite well aware how strong someone has to be to be, to be chosen to join the Seven Ninja Swordsmen. I actually fought a former member a few months ago, and a friend of mine fought another. Chojuro's eyes widened in shock, but before he could stutter out a reply, Eo's head whipped around to stare right at him with a severe intensity burning in his one visible eye. You what? He asked. Who and where might I ask? We've been trying to track a bunch of those fools down for a while now. Well, my friend and his team fought Zabuza Momochi over in Wave. He attacked them during a mission. Daiki shrugged casually like it was no big deal. It was time to apply the pressure already after all. And I came across Raiga Kurosaki. He had teamed up with a few bastards from another village. He had big plans to attack Kanoha, in fact. So I killed him. If possible, Chijuro's eyes widened even further. W wait why you were the one who KK killed Raiga? He gasped out in shock. Among a few others at the time. Daiki shrugged. I see. 
Ao's eye narrowed at him. You wouldn't happen to know then what happened to our weapons that he absconded with when he betrayed us, would you? Daiki continued smiling pleasantly. I might, he replied easily with another shrug. But that isn't really here nor there right now, is it? Ao visibly bit the inside of his cheek to stop himself from snapping. After all, Daiki couldn't have been more obvious he was in possession of the Kiba blades, even if he just came out and said it. Even so, his old man temper was easily frayed by young bucks like him. Daiki could see very minute little twitch in his skin with the Shinkigan, no matter the emotional control he had. Daiki's smile widened. That's a nice eye you've got under that eye patch, by the way. He cut him before he could say anything in reply. I'm good friends with a few girls from a clan who all have eyes just like that one. Eo froze. The meaning behind what he said, pleasant and complimentary sounding as it was, couldn't be hidden at all. You can't say shit about me having those swords. You stole from us first eye patch face. Eo forced a smile on his face. I see you have friends in high places I suppose. He chuckled. Though to Daiki it sounded more teeth grinding. And it's very impressive such a young lad managed to overcome Raiga. He was a very powerful shinobi. I wouldn't know. Daiki just shrugged. Pleasant smile not twitching a fraction of an inch. If I'm being honest, he didn't last very long. I killed him in one hit. I was actually quite disappointed. I guess the bounty on his head was nice at least I suppose. Kinda cheap though for an A rank. A vein pulsed on Ao's neck. O almost robotically turned back around and continued on. Very impressive. He bit out. Not looking back at all. If Daiki's pleasant smile flickered into a victorious smirk for a moment, then it was really just a trick of the light. Even though they were outside. Totally. That's our really incredible Daiki-san. Chojuro was a lot different though. Giving him a bit of an odd look. I, I don't think I see could beat Raigasan in a fight. But you did it in one hit attack? I, I suppose it's no wonder you were chosen to be an envoy at So Why Young if you're that as strong. He fumbled his words a bit. But he was honest at least. Anko he saw in his peripheral had raised her eyebrow at him. He flashed the finger at her. They were led from the port into the main elevated paths of the village. Towards the large spherical building he'd noticed at the very center of the village. Once they reached it, Ao bid them to wait outside the Mizukage's office while he went in to announce their arrival. Which was really just code for him to let her know what he'd gleaned from them on their little walk into the village while Chojuro stood watch over them and made sure they didn't get up to anything funky. Not that they would. He and Anko hadn't spoken a word to each other since Ao and Chojuro appeared. There really wasn't any need. Daiki relaxed in one of the chairs outside the Mizukage's office, casually leaning on his elbow after sitting it on the armrest and sweeping his gaze over the interior with his eyes. Umbu littered the place. Dozens of them spread out throughout the building, which was to be expected. The only place he hadn't checked was the Mizukage's office. After all the hype and crap Anko and the old man were giving him about how hot she was, he wanted to see her face to face when he saw her for the first time, see if that wow factor was real or not. In the meantime, he made some small talk with Chojuro and probed him about Meitarumi. But, beyond having nothing but praise for her, he didn't really let anything slip. A jonin was a jonin, he supposed, even if they were timid and shy. Finally, after a few minutes, Ao returned, stepping out of the office and closing the door behind him quickly. Ahem. He coughed, standing in front of the door. Mizukage sama will see you now. He said directly to him. Finally. Sounds good. Daiki replied and stood up. But as Anko made to the same from the other chair she was lounging in, Ao shook his head. Mizukage sama will only see the boy, no bodyguard allowed, he stated. As a show of good faith, she has dismissed her umbu guard as well. You're kidding, right? Anko scowled, crossing her arms. Yet her shoulders were tense. You can't believe we're that stupid, can you? And just what are you implying? O oh, narrowed his singular eye at her. Are you the ones who brought up the talk of a possible alliance in the first place, making allegations against us? Anko growled, eyes narrowing angrily at his tone. She'd saw right through the game already, as had he, separating him from his bodyguard and putting the pressure on him of dealing with a Kage face to face all alone. Daiki didn't say a thing and merely flicked his fingers towards Anko, and a quick pulse of chakra left him. 
Don't get baited, it's fine. They're just trying to get an edge now after I dabbed on them on the way here. Daiki transmitted a message to her with his chakra. Her eyes flickered to him, before she huffed into a smirk. Nothing like that. Calm down, grouchy. She shrugged in reply. Man, reaching aren't you? Nah, it's just the kid is a bit of a playboy. Trust me, he doesn't need the bodyguard for anything fighting related. It's to keep him getting lured in by a nice set of tits. And I hear your mizukage has got a sweet set on her. W watch what you say, woman. Eo's eye widened at her statement. How indecent. Back in my day, women had class. Chajuro wasn't really any better, his face beat red. Eh, I'm not that bad. Daiki's pleasant debonairly handsome smile turned into a smirk full of ill intentions. But alone time with Meitarumi? Sign me up. We can speak kage to kage. Wait, what? Ao's head whipped around to stare at him. What do you mean kage to kage? He demanded. Anko's words being completely forgotten about. He means just that grouchy. Anko gave him a devilish smirk. This kid is the next in line to be Hokage. Why do you think someone so young was chosen as the envoy? Hokage-sama chose him specifically for this mission, because he has the strength needed for the position. This is just him getting his feet wet with his future duties. Io's face fell completely. Thanks for the escort, buddy. Daiki flashed the man a thumbs up as he swaggered his way over and motioned for him to open the door. And like a robot that had lost all conscious thought, Ao did just that, opening the door for him to enter and standing aside, and shutting it closed as soon as he stepped in. Once inside, Daiki's eyes immediately took note of the space within almost unconsciously. It was a wide open spherical room with dark blue flooring and dark gray walls. It was sparsely decorated with a few pictures, but otherwise the only thing of note within the large spherical room was the large desk at the other side of the room and the oval curving window panels that gave a full view out over the village. Much more interesting though, and the thing or rather person that took up his conscious gaze though, was the woman leaning against the desk, arms crossed and a pleasant smile across her plump, shiny pink lips. And what a woman she was. She was tall for a woman, her stature a few inches above the average height of women he was used to, with eyes a mesmerizing and piercing shade of emerald green. Fair-skinned and beautiful. She was clad in a figure accenting blue battle dress that hung from her chest and didn't cover her shoulders at all, dangling to just past her knees, with her feet clad in sturdy blue tolis ninja boots, and left plenty of cleavage to his gaze. Like goddamn, her melons were massive, bigger even than Anko's. Yet, despite their size hung high, proud and perky on her chest. But yet despite the temptingly deep valley of cleavage she displayed, Daiki's attention was more focused on her hair and her face. Her face was sharp, yet beautiful, with thin, almost dainty cheekbones that curved in at an angle that made her face look incredibly feminine and beautiful. An eye-catching curtain of wavy auburn absolutely gorgeous hair, tied at the top with a top knot reached down past her backside, nearly to her ankles, while her bangs curved around her face, hiding one from view and framing only shimmering emerald green eye, giving her an almost ethereal mysterious look. Oh no, she's stupid hot. Daiki thought in that moment. Anko and the old man might have been hyping it up a bit more than necessary, but they weren't exactly lying. Meitarumi was stupidly gorgeous. Beyond gorgeous even. Those looks, those eyes, that hair. And those goddamn curves. He had to admit, Mei was definitely the most beautiful women he'd ever seen. Except maybe Naruko, but she didn't count on account of not really existing. Shame that. Hello there. Yuriai Daikidano, is it not? Meitarumi spoke, her voice throaty, dare he say almost sultry. You know, when Ao informed me of how young you apparently were, I was quite shocked. You're quite the impressive young man. Thank God for Anko. And Karinai, I guess. If not for grinding with them, I may have been stunned silent by her beauty. Alas for her, the grind never failed to provide for those truly loyal to its holy scripture. Well, like I told Ao a bit ago, Daiki began with a shrug as he approached her, the casual, confident smile as always a staple on his face. We at the Leaf Village are quite known for our young, handsome, and incredibly skilled prodigies. Ho ho, quite the confidence too, Mei laughed lightly, her single-shown green eye idly roving over him, 
lingering on his arms and collarbone for just a tiny microsecond before returning to meet his gaze. Well, I suppose you're not wrong at all, you're quite the fine-looking young man, very handsome. I'm curious what you'll be like in a few years. Taller, with even bigger muscles, and an even more handsome, no doubt. Daiki's smile widened as he curled his arm and flexed his bicep. I'd ask if the same would be true for you, but it might be impossible for a woman like you to get even more beautiful. Her single shown green eye blinked slowly, before her pink lips curved up into a wide smile of their own. Well now, aren't you just a delightful young man? She noted. Dangerous too. Her eye flickered to his bicep and back to his eyes so fast, he wouldn't even been able to notice without his shinkigan. Well I am a shinobi, Daiki shrugged, before making a show of looking around. Though I should probably be careful not to step on anyone's toes like that. Time to start the game. In what way, I'm afraid I don't follow. The Mizukage arched an eyebrow. Just what I said, he shrugged. A woman as gorgeous, strong and accomplished as you. If you were single you'd have people beating on the doors trying to ask you out. Hell I'd be first in line. But I'm here for negotiations above all else. So I don't really want to step on the toes of your boyfriend or husband or whatever significant other you have and piss them off and make things go sour. Beyond anything physical, the one central weakness Mei Terumi had was a complex over her age and single status. To some, that might seem very silly for a person as monstrously powerful as her. She was the Mizukage, Kage were thought to be the pinnacle of all people, the strongest, the fastest, three most powerful bar none, and a reputation had been cultivated over the period the hidden villages had existed. That a Kage was undefeatable. They were unstoppable, unsurmountable titans. Almost deity-like figures to the common masses. And while it could truly be likened to that physically at the very least, mentally even Kage were still human. Mei Terumi was still a woman, with all the instincts and desires that came with being such. And to be frank, her youth and best years as a woman was spent fighting against the regime of the mind-controlled Yugura. She was 29, approaching 30 years old, and she'd never had a lover to speak of despite her incredible beauty. A true blue Christmas cake in the flesh, left to rot on the shelf. May twitched. It was barely noticeable and was covered up at such speeds Daiki and honestly most wouldn't have noticed normally. But the Shinkigan enhanced his analytical vision and mental prowess to the limit and allowed him to perceive the most minute changes in body language and chakra. Even a Kage could not hide their body language from him. Well, luckily for you, you don't have to worry about that. There's no significant other in my life. May's lips twisted into a slightly sour expression but only for the briefest of moments before being replaced with a pleasant smile. So there's nothing for you to worry about. So you don't need to worry about complimenting me like that. Wait, what? Daiki made a show of being surprised, eyebrows rising, eyes widening and mouth dropping though, before laughing and shaking his head. Nah, there's no way. He waved off her words as if she were joking. Her smile widened ever so slightly. No, I'm afraid not, she said, but she now looked very pleased. Of course this wouldn't change anything about how negotiations would truly go. But he wasn't trying to with that. He was pursuing the option of having her gain the slightest fondness for him. For instance, not wanting him to die by having a bijou extracted. And making other options offered seem much more tempting than that prospect. Not that it would ever come to that mind you, but it would make steering her towards other deals easier. The hell is wrong with the guys in this village? Daiki palmed his forehead. Though this definitely wasn't a put-upon act, he was being truthful with it. Why aren't they lining up trying to put a ring on your finger and get you in a wedding dress? Honestly, he'd love to see her in one. A lacy little white number, plunging neckline, garter and all. A light laugh left her throat. You're really quite the charming young man, aren't you? May tittered. Personally, I could not tell you. I've been wondering myself. Yeah, I don't get it. Daiki shrugged, before smirking massively. In that case... It's my lucky day then. Finders keepers, loser weepers. How about we put this negotiation off for now and go on a date instead? Oh, May gave him a genuinely surprised look. Just like that. I mean, have you looked in a mirror lately? Daiki shrugged. Hell yeah. He pumped his fist into the air before pointing a finger at her. You think I'd stroll past a glimmering diamond that I just came across? Or what? 
step back and observe it for some reason instead. He snorted. No, of course I'm going to snatch it up for myself. This is practically the same thing. Era, era. Truly, you are a silver-tongued one, aren't you? May stood up from where she was leaning on the desk and casually invaded his personal space, trailing a finger up his cheek ever so gently. Are all the young men of the leaf like you? She wondered. Nah, I'm just built different. Daiki proudly boasted. So how about that date? Maybe one at the beach? I'm sure you've got a few nice ones here in the mist and I'd love to see you in a bikini. Well now, this is definitely a first for me, Daiki Dano, May admitted. I do have to admit though, given the choice I'd definitely take you up on that offer. I can't say I've ever had the chance to have a date on the beach. Just call me Daiki Mizukich-sama. You don't need to be polite with me. I prefer casual, he grinned at her and decided to be a little daring since she was already invading his own personal space and boldly placed his hand on her hip, and he felt her stiffen ever so slightly. After the beach, we could hit up the movies, have dinner, make a whole day of it. Perhaps I can give you a massage if you're up for it. I've got it on good authority that woman can't get enough of my hands on them. Or well, Karinai at least couldn't get enough of it when he was testing it out with using his lightning affinity to stimulate her nerves while using his mythical palm jutsu to work her muscles. Karinai, if nothing else, was a great test dummy. Oh my! May almost looked a little overwhelmed at his offer, before shaking her head. It's lamentable that these negotiations are quite important, otherwise I would definitely take you up on that offer. She pouted, almost disappointedly before stepping back out of his personal space taking her hand off of his cheek, disappointing but expected, anticipated even. Personally, I think they'd be much better to bring up as pillow talk Mizukich-sama. He laughed. May giggled lightly. You're so bold daiki -kuen. She cupped her cheek. Please, since you allowed me to call you by name, just call me May. I'll do that then, May. His grin never faded once as he shrugged. So let's get these negotiations out of the way quickly, then so we can talk about something much more interesting, like what kind of bikini would look best on you. Stop that. She laughed lightly again before sighing, and a serious expression appearing on her face, as walked around her desk to sit at her chair. So then, down to business. Sarutobi Dano brought up the possibility of an alliance between both the Mist Village and Leaf Village. She brought up, even as she gestured at one of the chairs in front of her desk for him to sit down on. All right then, time to get serious. That's right, Daiki nodded, taking the seat. He leaned back and lifted one leg to rest the foot of it over his knee. I'm just going to be blunt if that's fine with you. I'm not a fan of dancing around things, as you can no doubt tell. I did notice that yes, she nodded, a flash of a smile appearing on her face before it vanished beneath her serious facade once more. Feel free. I admit I find that kind of thing refreshing. He nodded once. The mist is at the weakest it's ever been, Daiki then bluntly said. You yourself are powerful, but beyond you the mist is lacking at the moment. You only have one of the seven swords and a single wielder. You were once known for being the village with the most bloodline limits, but now barely have any to speak of. The amount of battle-ready ninja under your command is at an all-time low and to top it all off, you've lost both the Sanbai and the Rokubi. This is all true, yes. It hurt to hear it all said out loud though I have to admit. May stapled her fingers together atop her desk, a frown twisting across her pretty shiny pink lips. We are weakened severely and still in the process of recovering our strength. The weakened I do have to point out, does not mean weak. The last part was said quite firmly and he felt her chakra spike, making the air in the room press down on him heavily. She didn't have anything on old man Sarutobi though. That was a trick he'd shown off quite a lot, a subset of killing intent apparently it was called. There wasn't actually a name for it according to the old man, just that it was something all Kage tended to throw around for a variety of reasons, one of the main being the simple statement of, I am strong, a reminder more than anything else on just what kind of beast a Kage truly was. Tobarama doing this generated such force that Orochimaru, Sasuke, Yugo and Suijetsu were almost crushed by it on the spot. I never said you were... Beautiful. Daiki grinned at her, not at all affected by it. She cut off the pressure and looked away, hiding her face slightly by her wavy hair framing her face. A sigh left her mouth. I see you didn't defeat Raiga for nothing, she mused, 
before turning back to face him. Well then, Daiki Kuen, since you've listed our faults, I have to ask the question then. Why does the leaf seek an alliance with the mist? What do you hope to gain from it? While you have suffered substantial losses yourself, only a fool would not realize the leaf are still the strongest of the five great villages, and is in alliance with the sand. Even if cloud and stone formed an alliance which is highly doubtful, you will still win. We would, Daiki agreed without a shadow of a doubt or a hint of shame. Though you're a bit wrong on one take there, our alliance with the sand is on death's door at this point, that clown they call a Kazakage has it out for us after all. Jealousy and incompetence tends to do that. Truly, May hummed. I'd heard tensions had been quite high because of the wind daimyo, but I didn't think your alliance was quite that far gone. Raza's an incompetent moron, what else can be said? Daiki shrugged and had no regret at all insulting the man. He killed his own wife in his attempt to make his youngest son a jinchuriki. Then he proceeded to isolate said son away from everyone else with his uncle as a caretaker, and make the kid rely on him and love him with all his heart. Then ordered the uncle to make a failed assassination attempt, unveil himself and basically tell the kid he had hated him all along. I'm sure you've heard heart the story of Gara of the Sand. May actually winced. I'd heard the boy was a brutal insane monster, not any of that, she admitted. All villages have their way of raising Jinchuriki, but I can't begin to fathom what led him to that sort of conduct. From what I hear, he wanted to make his son a killing machine that was loyal only to the village, Daiki revealed. He accomplished one side of that, I suppose, but being a killing machine doesn't really mean much when he's weak. But then, this is that clown Raza we're talking about, he sent the second strongest person in his village, Pakura of the Scorch style off here to get ambushed and killed by you guys for whatever reason. He snorted. God he hated Raza. Wait Raza, wasn't he dead right now? He should have been killed off not long ago by Orochimaru. And actually, Daiki knew the rough whereabouts of his corpse. Something to think about when I'm done here. Daiki put that thought away for the moment. I see. You have quite the opinion on the Kazakage. May noted. Still, the sand truly didn't add all that much to your overall fighting power in the alliance. Raza was known for rarely ever leaving the sand, that doesn't quite explain why you would want an alliance with us, especially when our general distance is farther than Suna and of course the geographical obstacles. To be honest, it's the old man's idea, Daiki admitted. Like, I'm quite happy allying with you guys if only because it means I get to see you, but overall he wants to invite you guys into an alliance to make up for the fact we've got a few things of yours, or at least how the world sees it and I'll be blunt, we're not giving them back. Already getting to that, then are we? May hummed. So there is no way your village will part with the Kiba Blades then? And return them to us? More specifically, I won't... Daiki smirked. Technically, they were never really yours to begin with. They belong to the Uzumaki, and as the Leaf is the only surviving ally of the Uzumaki, they rightfully belong to us. Not to mention we actually have surviving Uzumaki in our village. Well, just the one, but still. Oh, so you kept them for yourself after defeating Raiga, her single visible eyebrow rose in surprise at his admittance. Bold of you to admit that straight to me, the Mizukage and refuse to return the blades while using such an excuse. We both know that truly doesn't hold up. They were claimed from defeated foes. Exactly, Daiki pointed out. I just did the same thing you guys did, so you can't really complain. May snorted. True I will admit as such, she nodded. It is odd though that the leaf would bring up an alliance and then bring this sort of thing up like this. Charming as I found you so far, Daiki Kuen. This so far has been quite insulting to we of the mist. The alliance is more to stop you guys from kicking up a fuss and making things harder for us, Daiki bluntly told her. And it isn't just the swords. Let me ask you. Do you know what Raiga was up to when I came across him? I can't say I do I'm afraid we had no idea where he was, May replied, eyeing him curiously. If we did, we'd have long sent Hunter Ninja after him to take him out and retrieve the Kiba Blades. How does it pertain to this situation, I have to ask? Well, before that, Daiki shrugged. Let me say this. It's not like you guys don't have something of ours either. How about this? I'll give you the Kiba Blades back. But I'm plucking that Byakugan in Ao's head in return and taking it back with me. May's single eye widened. How do you know of that? She questioned. Ao wears seals specifically that block the Byakugan from seeing inside it. 
Yes, he had noticed that. Those odd papers he wore from his ears like earrings were in fact seals. Seals that were actually a lot like the seals within the Hokage Mountain, though of lesser make by far. That's a secret. Daiki winked. So, wanna trade? God, he hoped she didn't. While he knew how to make more, it would take a truckload of time to do it. Time he didn't want to bother with right now. Time that was really better suited to other things. Though he supposed adding a Byakugan wouldn't be too bad alongside Shursue's Sharingan. But he could get an actual set of Byakugan from any Hyuga corpse as long as he had enough stored chakra. May sighed. All right, understood. She nodded begrudgingly. Putting that aside, why did you feel the need to bring up what Raiga was doing when you encountered him? In reply, Daiki touched his hand to the turtle-faced pauldron on his shoulder. It has to do with this little thing here. It's a special pauldron that was made by the village of artisans, he said. It's a very special little piece of armor. Specifically, it was made with the ability absorb an absurd amount of chakra. It can drain a massive amount rapidly, even out of a bijou. She examined it for a moment before meeting his eyes. Impressive, but what does that have to do with Raiga? She questioned. He'd switched its visage up for this meeting for a bit, so it honestly just looked like a normal roaring turtle head. He teamed up with the nobles of the village of artisans who had a grudge against the leaf. Daiki revealed his most bullshit of lies that had actually gotten him into the position he was now. He needed their help because he found the sandby. May's eyes widened. The sandby has already reformed? And that far away? She shot up to her feet. Yes, Daiki revealed bluntly. See, they had this big plan together. They were going to subdue the sandby with Raiga's strength and the tools made by the nobles of the village of artisans. They planned on subduing the sandby to do their bidding and use its chakra to somehow resurrect their old leader Saimai, who was killed decades ago by the Naidame Hokage. I'm sorry, May gained an almost befuddled look. How would they even be able to do such a thing? How would the Sanbai's chakra allow that? Nah, they had a way of doing it already themselves. What they lacked was the sheer chakra needed to do it. Daiki shrugged. Either way, that isn't important. What is important is that they and Raiga, after resurrecting that guy, were planning on unleashing the Sanbai on the leaf. And I just so happened to come across them while they were in the process of doing that while on a mission to the village of artisans. That fool... May sighed, rubbing her temple. I'm assuming then, Daikikuin, that you put a stop to it all? Refuge in audacity, baby. Yes, but probably not in the way you're thinking, Daiki replied. See the guys Raiga teamed up with. There were four of them, and each of them were just as strong as Raiga. Now I like myself a whole lot, and I'm amazingly strong. But I wasn't strong enough then to beat five shinobi on that level alone. They were definitely not as strong as Raiga. She didn't need to know that though. Which brings us back to the question then. Just how did you manage to kill Raiga then and claim the Kiba Blades? May wondered. Well, I'm actually pretty talented with seals. The old man says I might even be more talented than the Yandame. The smirk returned to Daiki's face. When they were subduing the Sanbai and were exhausting themselves in the process, I jumped in, sealed the Sanbai in myself and then used its power to kill them all. I'm sorry. May mouthed and just stared at him for a moment. That makes no sense. While I cannot account for your ability with the sealing arts, and will not contest them at all if the Sandam Hokage claimed as such, it still simply isn't possible. It takes time to be able to use a bijou's power. The only way that would be possible is if you completely subdued the bijou. Or the bijou cooperated with me willingly. Daiki pointed out happily. Highly unlikely. May shook her head. Why would the bijou cooperate with the person who just sealed them? We'll get back to that, because it has a lot to do with your old Mizukage before he died. Daiki shrugged and stood up. If you want, I'll show you proof. Very well. I admit you've piqued my curiosity in multiple ways now. May nodded, gesturing for him to proceed. All right then, try not to fall in love with me. He winked at her. Or do, I'll happily go out with you if you do. She gave him a mirth-filled look even as he concentrated chakra into his eyes. A familiar red dust shimmered into existence before seeping into his body. Incredible. I can't sense your chakra now even with me standing right in front of you. May noted. A dojitsu? Yup. Daiki nodded. 
It's a special little trick that lets me hide my chakra. Sensors can't feel my chakra at all, and even the Byakugan can't see my chakra at all either. I've never heard of such a dojitsu or ability. Make up her chin? Quite terrifying, actually. You haven't seen anything yet. Daiki laughed, and then he went for the big reveal. He spread his arms wide open and reached deep within him to touch upon Isabu's chakra and called it forth. In all but an instant, it bubbled into existence. Unlike Naruto's that took time to form as a new inexperienced Jinchuriki, he was anything but. The crimson red chakra cloak formed around him in the blink of an eye. Three massive shrimp-like chakra tails waving behind him. May's eyes widened in shock. All three tails, and that easily? She gaped. You were actually telling the truth, but that speed. Not even Yagura could call upon all three tails of the chakra cloak so swiftly. He didn't say anything, just continued grinning at her and let her come to the conclusions on her own. A truly perfect Jinchuriki, she realized, and then something else dawned in her eyes and something like a cross between awe and horror shone in her emerald green gaze. And I still can't sense your chakra even like this, Assuming you are indeed a perfect Jinchuriki then, she trailed off. Yeah, I can't be sensed even in our full bijou mode, Daiki confirmed for her. Even my jutsu can't be sensed. I could fire off a bijudama and not a single person would be able to sense it. That's almost too absurd to believe. If I didn't see this right now, I would not believe it. May shook her head and slumped back into her chair, a long, frustrated, dismayed sigh leaving her lips. This is going to cause an uproar in my village, you realize? Waving his hand, Daiki dismissed the chakra cloak and it disappeared in the blink of an eye, as if it were never there to begin with. Already given up demanding for the sandby back? He teased her. Who would ever agree and do such a thing? May snorted. The ability to be completely undetected, even while using the full power of a bijou. That is the thing Kages like myself have nightmares about. You could waltz into other villages and destroy them before anyone even realizes what is happening. Yeah, I'm kind of awesome like that. Daiki puffed his chest out and leaned against her desk. Anyway, now you've heard on basically why we want this alliance. Are you ready to hear about why you'll want to ally with us? I'll be honest at this point. I just assumed the underlying thread that you'll fire a tailed beast bomb at my village without me able to do a single about it would be the incentive. May snorted. Nah. Daiki laughed. That's just to get you to go out on that date with me, and maybe let me pick out the bikini. May ran a hand through her lovely, thick auburn hair. My my, truly you are a dangerous boy. She laughed despite herself. Well then, what is the true incentive the leaf is offering? May hadn't been sure what to expect when the renowned and legendary professor, the god of Shinobi, the Sandame Hokage Saratobi Haruzen reached out to her with the notion of an alliance between the hidden mist and the hidden leaf. It had come completely out of left field and not something she'd expected to ever happen in her wildest dreams. Since the inception of both villages, not once had they been allies. And to be frank, as much as it hurt to admit, there was little they could offer the leaf, especially in their weakened state. They had lost the vast majority of their most powerful force. They had lost both of their bijou. Their troops were at an all-time low. Even monetary-wise, they were completely in the red. That said, while the temptation had been there to save face and block off the offer, she wouldn't allow her pride to outweigh the benefits that the mist could obtain from such an alliance, even if briefly. Upon agreeing, she'd been sent another message from the leaf, to expect an envoy who had the Hokage's full backing and approval in the negotiations. She was not at all expecting a young teenager, and definitely wasn't expecting one, like Daiki Yurii, the boy casually leaning against her desk, as if he weren't in a foreign village grinned boyishly at her. Incentive, huh? Well, how about I start with a gift? A gift? She hummed, before smiling at the boy. Is it perhaps expensive chocolates or jewelry? I'm told those are a staple for dates. Was it wrong for her to partake in flirting with the young man? A foreign shinobi? Definitely. But he was such a handsome young lad. And just look at those arms. So yummy. Just what would they feel like wrapped around her, sinking into her skin? Sadly not. I wasn't sure what kind of things you preferred. Daiki shook his head, grin never leaving his face. You should let me know for next time. 
and fill me in on your three sizes while we're at it. I'll need them if I'm gonna buy you clothes as a gift too. Like that bikini for instance. So brazen and bold. Men rarely paid her attention romantically, for reasons she simply could not fathom no matter how she tried to appeal to them. So none had ever spoken to her anywhere close to the way this boy was. It made her belly flip-flop deep inside, and it took a concentrated effort not to giggle girlishly. Men from the leaf were truly a different breed from here in the much more conservative mist. I'll keep that in mind for when we finish up here, she replied, and if she fluttered her eyelashes just a little bit, well that was just normal wasn't it? For reference, what kind of bikini do you prefer? Daiki leaned slightly over her desk, and as he did that deep scarlet gaze of his flickered to her abundant cleavage and his gaze turned almost hungry, sending a shiver down her spine, and he made no attempt to hide where he was looking. Personally, I'd love to see you in a nice little string bikini, maybe in pink or white, such blatant lust for her as if he wanted to launch himself over the desk at her and snatch her up and have his way with her. If he did, she might just let him. I've never worn one. It's actually not something you'll find on sale anywhere here in the mist, she admitted. After all, for the over a decade they'd been in the process of a civil war, beach attire was hardly going to be a seller during that kind of period. I suppose I'll have to leave it up to you, she winked at him. A look of surprised flash across his face at her words as if he couldn't believe what she was saying, just like when she told him of her single status, as if he couldn't believe men weren't lining up for her, as if he couldn't believe there was not a clamor to see her within a bikini. It made him all the more appealing to her. She would definitely steal him away from the leaf right here and now if he weren't such an incredibly important person to the leaf, they would definitely go to war over this boy. Anyone would. The surprise was replaced a moment later by that boyish grin again, so I'll be the first to ever see you in a bikini, huh? Nice, I'll hold you to that then. He laughed in delight, prompting her to laugh alongside him. For now though, gift-wise, I suppose you'll have to settle for this. He held his hand out and suddenly space twisted, and a massive blade appeared in his grasp, her eyes widened. Kubikira Bocho, she uttered in surprise. She'd heard rumors that Zabuza Momochi had been killed, but to think it had been true and it seemed that it was at the hands of the leaf just like Raiga. Did they hunt him down specifically to use in talks of this alliance? Was Daiki the one to do it? Just like with Raiga? Either way, as far as gifts went to open up negotiations, it was quite the grand one. Personally, she would have preferred the bikini. If he was that interested in her dress as she was now after all, just imagine what he'd be like in such a skimpy outfit. He'd probably pin her down right then and there and have his way with her. Even so, thank you, she thanked him as the leader of the Mist Village. This will go a long way to restoring some of our lost strength. That's good, Daiki nodded, placing the blade down atop her desk in front of her. Beyond that, I know where the rest are. Huh? She blinked. You do. They knew of course where Samahata was or at least who had it. They had no idea where Kisame Hashigaki was though, and retrieving the blade form him was a pipe dream right now. Even she wasn't sure of her ability to defeat him. With Samahata in hand, he was a direct counter to her. Beyond that they knew just whom had the Kiba blades had been alongside Kubikura Bocho well until now at least, but the rest? They didn't have the faintest idea where they were. Samahata is in the hands of Kisame obviously, and he's part of a group you might have heard of. A mercenary group called the Akatsuki. Daiki revealed. Her eyes widened. The Akatsuki. Of course she had heard of them. They were quite well known for selling their services to the highest bidder. She had no idea Kisame had joined them though. But beyond that was something she'd kept close to her chest. The only others who knew of it were Ao and Chijuro. In their final battle with Yagura, they'd learned that through the vast majority of his tenure, he'd been under an obscenely powerful Jinjutsu, and that there were ties to Akatsuki. She'd long since held the suspicion that Akatsuki had somehow been controlling Yagura, but had no proof. Wait, something Daiki said not long ago clicked for her. He had alluded to information he had about Yagura that he had obtained through the Sanbai. And now bringing up the Akatsuki, did he know the truth behind Yagura? If the Sanbai was truly working with Daiki, it meant he would be privy to everything Yagura ever knew as well. 
and everything the Sanbai had learned of their village since they first started creating Jinchuriki for it at the inception of their village. As for the rest, while Orochimaru stole them at some point, Daiki continued giving an annoyed sigh. Honestly, that guy is one of the biggest ever embarrassments to the leaf. It might take a little while, but I'll take care of him in the future as well and get them back for you. Mei blinked, putting aside the possible thoughts of Yagura and the Akatsuki. That's quite the claim to make, she pointed out. Indeed the Hokage did claim you had his full backing and authority for these negotiations, but promising the slaying of Orochimaru of all people is a bit much no? The confidence with which he said it was very attractive, but she still had to wonder. Just where did such confidence stem from to promise such a thing? It's not the old man's authority I'm claiming that with, it's mine. He said and May blinked as the teenager leaned across her desk fully to cup her chin. You're talking to the one next in line to be Hokage Sweet Cheeks. I've already been chosen to become the Godame Hokage. Oh, oh, her eyes flew wide open in shock. Hokage at your age? She could not help but splutter. If true, he would be the youngest ever sitting Kage of the five great nations, and of the strongest and most affluent of them all at that. She of course knew he was powerful, being a truly perfect Jinchuriki alone brought that to the table. Even Yagura was not a truly perfect Jinchuriki. He could call upon the full power of the Sanbai, but he was not in full cooperation with the Bijou like Killer B was with the Hachibi. It meant that there was always a clash of wills even with the subdued Sanbai that bled off some of the total power and left Yagura without the Jinjutsu immunity true perfect Jinchuriki had. But simply being a perfect Jinchuriki would not be enough to be made a Kage, never mind of the Hidden Leaf Village. Yagura, after all, was her equal if not better even without the use of his bijou. It meant that the god of Shinobi himself considered Daiki strong enough to hold the position of Hokage even without the power of the Sanbai. And at such a young age, true the leaf are known for the absurd amount of young prodigies they churn out, but this is beyond even that. Her thoughts raced. Daiki, it seemed, was a truly remarkable individual. That is incredible, was all she could say. Yeah, I'm pretty great, he laughed letting go of her chin and casually sitting up cross-legged atop her desk and staring into her eye. I'd have to be to have a chance with a babe like you after all. He licked his lips, and as he did his sharp canines were exposed to her giving him an almost powerful feral look. Oh my, he looked like a wild beast who wanted to just gobble her up. And so modest too. She couldn't help but tease. He just grinned. Anyway beyond that, I know where the Rokubi Jinchuriki is as well. He dropped another massive bomb on her and her eyes widened once more. While I'd prefer you guys to leave the Rokubi alone, since me and the Sanbai are good buddies and that's one of his siblings, I won't stop you either. Though it's probably in your best interest to leave it for now anyway. Oh, she said, prompting him to continue. While it was true that subduing a Jinchuriki, even an untrained one, could be quite taxing on resources and without her there personally they were liable to lose people during the fight and it would take even more time and resources to train up a new Jinchuriki, the benefit of the war deterrent simply outweighed those losses, sad as it was to say. They needed at least one back sometime soon to ward off other villages that thought they were an easy target. The Akatsuki, Daiki said simply. Do you know what they're up to? I don't. Mei shook her head. What did they have to with all of this? I know very little about them beyond being a mercenary group and that they've been hired quite a bit by the Hidden Stone. Damn rock humpers. May was taken aback by the sudden venomous vitriol in the boy's tone all of a sudden as he spat to the side in outright disgust at the mere mention of the Hidden Stone. He shook his head, then met her eyes again. The Akatsuki are composed of a group of ten. Now nine S-class missing Nin after Orochimaru betrayed them. And their goal is the destruction of the five great nations. Their plan to accomplish that is the Bijou. They plan to kill all of the Jinchuriki, steal the Bijou and tell me May. Before now did you know the Bijou were siblings? No I did not. May replied even as her mind. Nine S-class missing ninja? And they wanted the Bijou? If such a force attacked the mist, they wouldn't be able to resist them at all. But why did they want the Bijou? Surely they did not think they could make themselves their Jinchuriki and control them as they pleased? But why else would they want them specifically? Most probably don't. I only found out through the Sanbai himself, 
and it's why he's willing to completely back me up. Daiki revealed and leaned forward staring absolutely seriously into her eyes, losing the light, confident and flirty demeanor he did previously. Once upon a time, the Bijou were all one being. That being was called the Jubi, an absolutely unstoppable monster, with all the combined might of every Bijou and then some. It was only stopped in the end, by the Sage of Six Paths alongside his equally as powerful brother. The Jubi, the legendary Sage of Six Paths, a brother to the Almighty Sage as well who was just as powerful? I just learned of something both incredible and terrifying, May thought odd, assuming it was true of course. Upon his deathbed, to stop the beast from reforming when he passed, the Sage of Six Paths split the Jubi's chakra into nine different parts. Daiki continued on, and created the moon to seal its physical body within. Such a fantastical thing. She had of course heard the Sage of Six Paths had created the moon. Most children had heard of that fairy tale. That seems too fantastical to be true. May shook her head. The sage was truly a godlike being. There was no doubt. But creating the moon itself, how would one even accomplish such a thing? No matter their power? Trust me, it's true. Daiki shrugged. The creation of the moon was made through a jutsu known as Chibaku Tensei, an innate technique that is natural to those who possess the Rinnegan. The Rinnegan, the greatest and most powerful, the most legendary of the three great dojitsu. The eyes of a god. And how would you know that? May questioned him seriously. I don't wish to call you a liar Daiki Kuen, but this tale is fantastical beyond belief. I assume this is something you heard from the Sanbai? What if it is just manipulating you? The Rinnegan has never before been seen by anyone in this age, and we have no proof they even existed. Valid concerns, but trust me, they're real, he chuckled, not breaking his eye contact with her. After all, the leader of the Akatsuki has the Rinnegan. Oh, well now, didn't that change everything? Suddenly, a lot of things began to click into place. After all, it had always bothered her. Just what kind of person had the power to control a man as mighty and powerful as Yagura? Just what kind of person had the kind of power required to completely twist someone like Yagura completely against their nature? But if it was someone with the same eyes as the Sage of Six Paths himself, then it was definitely doable. Just how long have they been planning this? May couldn't help but wonder in abject shock. Decades, more even. Daiki sighed, running a hand through his spiky hair. They've been in the background fanning the flames of war between us all for ages. They want to keep us weak and against each other for when they're ready to put their plans into action. And it's why the mist and leaf specifically were targeted. Her brows furrowed. I could understand the leaf, you have always espoused for peace between us, but why us? We've been long known as the bloody mist for a reason. Because of Yagura, Daiki shrugged, making her blink. While personally I'm not too fond of the guy because he still forced my buddy to submit to him, he was in general a peace-loving guy, right? And he wanted to push for peace. If he ever got the chance, we would have most likely been allied already. And with us allied, the sand wouldn't have dared push things like they have now making for a three-way alliance between three of the Great Five Nations. It would cow both Cloud and Stone into submission, and we would have been free as an alliance to grow stronger over time without interruptions. I see. May bit her lip, her thoughts racing. But because they wanted us weak for their plans, they couldn't allow that. So instead, they targeted Yagura and put him under some form of Genjutsu and made him do the complete opposite and destroy everything he'd been building up instead. It was all beginning to make a vast amount of more sense now, and it brought a horrible pit to her stomach. It was the same reason why they targeted the leaf as well and released the QB, Daiki added. Someone attacked the previous Jinchuriki when she was giving birth, when her seal was at the weakest and unleashed the QB. In the process of fighting them off and resealing the QB, the Yandame died and we took a lot of losses in the process, not only only to the infrastructure of the village, but a lot of people too. They were behind the QB attack and the death of the Yandame Hokage? While she wasn't as surprised as she would have been due to the earlier revelations, it was still incredibly shocking to learn. Minato Namikaze was a genius among geniuses, and monstrously power, capable of killing a thousand IWA shinobi in mere moments with his fabled flying thunder god jutsu. 
People thought of him as the second coming of Hashirama Senju and thought that if he were allowed to reach his prime, it would be all but impossible for the Leaf to be defeated even if the other four great shinobi villages allied against them. He was one of the few men in the history of the shinobi to gain a flea on sight order. To think the Akatsuki were behind his death as well as the manipulation of Yagura. It showed just how insidious they truly were, how far their reach went. And it brought another question to her mind. You said this was all pre-planned to keep us weak in preparation for when they put their plan into motion. May swallowed. Do you know when they plan to do so? They've already started, Daiki replied to her absolute horror. They've already gotten their hands on the five tails. Not that the stupid rock humpers have noticed. They don't give a damn about their Jinchuriki and haven't noticed he's been taken. Oh, that was not good, not good at all. I see. So is this the reason behind why you want an alliance? May asked as more and more things began to click into place. Not only for the possible backup, but for the simple reason of making sure you don't have to worry about the rest of us when you try to deal with them. Admittedly, yeah. Daiki laughed a little bit and it was actually a little comforting that he was still casual about things with such a discussion. It meant he had a plan of sorts, perhaps multiple. We still have some time though, while they're moving right now, they won't start going all out in full force for another two years or so going by the information I've managed to gather, assuming nobody spooks them into action before then. Two years, huh? All things considered, not a whole lot of time. Make grimaced. You can't even guarantee a force capable of quashing an S-Class Shinobi in ten years without committing an absurd amount of forces. Never mind, too. Without current lacking manpower, I can't guarantee anyone but myself being capable of dealing with even one of their ranks. And should I have to fight too, it's unlikely I'll win. Especially if they were monsters like Kisame, and considering Daiki had name dropped Orochimaru as a previous member, then for sure each of them had to be monsters in their own right. And she could definitely see why Daiki advised her not to send her people after the Rokubi Jinchuriki. If they brought him or even just the Bijou back, it would paint a target on the village. With none of the Bijou currently within the village, it would mean a lot of the Akatsuki's attention would be focused elsewhere other than them, and they definitely couldn't deal with an assault from multiple S-Class Shinobi as they were right now, it would be the end of the Hidden Mist. That's fine, you alone are more than worth the alliance. Daiki winked. Besides, it'll be in our best interest to help you recover your strength, and we'll be adding two S-Rank Shinobi to our ranks within the next two years. Three if you don't already count Kakashi. Possibly four if another one works out right and at least a bunch of elite jonin tier if I have anything to say about it. Not counting yourself? May replied, raising an eyebrow at him, while trying her best to contain her one shock at the casual listing of such a thing. Putting the matter of Hataki Kakashi aside, that would still be 2S class he was confident about with a possible third, and a confidence in multiplier elite jonin level ninja. Nah, I'm already S class for sure, he laughed. But yeah, as far as that level goes, we have me, old man Sartobi, old man Danzo, who I'll give a boot up the butt if he drags his feet again, Jiraiya, guy who can hit on that level with the eight gates, and I'll be dragging Tsunade back as well. So that's five definite S-class levels, six once we get Tsunade back. And assuming everything works out to plan, that'll bring us to 10 S-class ninja in the leaf alone. And 11 with you included, that is again, assuming you accept the alliance. So 9S class without a doubt in his mind at least from the leaf. Another possible one. That was quite the force. If he was to believed and may actually did believe the young man. Then the leaf had already began to recover from the loss of the Yandame and then some. Admittedly, Saratobi Haruzen was getting on in age, as was the Shimura Danzo, but neither were close to the age of that old gnome of a fence sitter Anoki. So she didn't doubt they would be combat ready when needed. From that standpoint alone, allying with the leaf was the best bet. Taking refuge under the wings of a titan until they recovered their own strength would be a great way to protect the village. And that of course wasn't taking into account that if the Akatsuki were successful then they would be destroyed anyway. So it was in their best interests to join hands with the leaf. Before I give you my answer Daikikuen, is there any other world-shattering revelation you want to drop on me? She smiled prettily at him. So about now would probably be a good point to drop a good old rough estimate of where Madara and Hashirama stand. And remember, stats ain't linear, so like 200 in strength doesn't mean twice as strong as 100 in strength, and would in fact be closer to 4 or 5 times stronger, if not more. Name, 
Madara Uchiha post-resurrection no eyes. When he fought the Bijou and Naruto Sasuke Gara, age, chakra capacity, 50 million strength, 810 endurance, 825 durability, 830 agility, 850 taijutsu, 500 slash 500 ninjutsu, 500 slash 500 jinjutsu, 465 slash 500 bukajutsu, 500 slash 500 chakra control, 475 slash 500 name, Hashirama Senju, Sage Mode Age, Chakra Capacity, 100 million strength, 850 endurance, 865 durability, 850 agility, 800 taijutsu, 500 slash 500 ninjutsu, 500 out of 500 jinjutsu, 375 slash 500 bukajutsu, 480 out of 500 chakra control, 500 slash 500 so, yeah, well, beyond helping you guys recover, helping you out if you're in trouble and getting those swords back for you guys, there is one thing else, Daiki turned around and slid off of her table, casually walking around it, this isn't an offer for the Mist Village though, it's an offer to sweeten the deal from me to you, oh, she hummed in curiosity, even as he walked around to stand directly behind her, she couldn't feel his chakra at all, but her physical senses were well honed enough to feel his movements behind her. He placed his hands gently on her shoulders, before sliding them down her front and clasping his hands together over her chest, and she shivered as she felt the boy's lips touch the back of her ear. How would you like eternal youth? He whispered into her ear, as if hiding a great secret that only she was meant to overhear even though they were the only ones within the room. What? Eternal youth? She blinked rapidly. That was the offer he was giving her? You have the power to do that? May asked, voice low, almost a whisper in of itself as she was caught up in the boy's pace. I don't have the power to give immortality, but eternal youth is well within my power thanks to those idiots at the village of artisans and the sandby, he continued. My dojitsu is called the Shinkigen, and one of the abilities it has is to turn chakra into pure life force, which I can not only use on myself but give to others. With the absurd amount of chakra I have as a Jinchuriki, I can create an absurd amount of life force. As I am right now, without focusing on it much, I'm generating roughly 20 years worth of life force per month passively for myself. But I can do so much more given time and the right incentive. May swallowed heavily. That... That was something alright. That went way beyond mere incentive. Did... Did he know she'd been worrying about her age? That she was a complete Christmas cake left on the shelf that no man would ever want? Doomed to be forever alone and never find a man to love her? And you're offering eternal youth to me if I agree to the alliance with the leaf? May replied, unable to hide the tremble in the voice. Excitement? Awe? Shock? She could not tell. Well, it would be a shame after all for your gorgeous looks to be lost to time. Daiki chuckled in her ear, and it made her shiver. I'm gonna be really blunt, May. Do you know the first thing I thought when I walked into this room and saw you leaning against that desk? No. She licked her lips. Tell me. I wanted to bend you over it and shaboink you silly. A gasp left her throat at his bold, crass words. I wanted to make you scream my name until those gorgeous green eyes of yours rolled up into the back of your skull. And I still want to do it right now. May felt the heat rising on her cheeks and even lower down as her heart pounded within her chest. Never had she heard words like this directed at herself. Never had she had anyone talk to her like this. Never had a man shown such interest in her. Never had a man ever made her feel like this. Never had a man so boldly spoken his desire towards her. Never had a man so openly desired her, and wanted her in the way that she had so desperately wanted them to. Daiki's hands unfastened and he grabbed her by the arm, pulling her up and then spinning her around. She could have stopped him easily. She didn't though and allowed the young, handsome leaf boy to pin her against her desk. He looked down at her, eyes alight with heat and want, a smirk on his lips as she looked up at him, her own eyes wide with shock, her lips slightly parted, her heart racing, her skin tingling with anticipation, the heat inside her building and burning hot, Desire shook her body. Era, era, bend me over my desk, huh? The purr that came from her lips 
was all instinct. Her hands came up and she looked them behind the boy's neck. Her decision was made before this offer came about. And with it on the table and in this situation, everything she wanted being offered to her, everything she could ever dream of, there was no way she could say no. Maybe we can talk more about than our date. And then his lips were over hers, the young ravenous shinobi of the leaf, pinning her against her desk as he conquered her lips with his own. A world of new sensations rocked May over the next few moments as her mouth was plundered. Her tongue conquered, defeated, her lips bruised and yielding. When Daiki pulled back over a minute later, May's legs almost felt shaky, her breath heaving in her chest. Well, that was something. May spoke after a moment, her tongue trailing over her lips and trying and failing to bite back a grin as she held the gaze of the boy staring back at her a challenging smirk on his face. His hand still resting on her hips squeezed, before he stepped into her and pressed against her front and she felt the distinct feeling of something very large and very hard pressing into her stomach. Is that a kunai in your pants or are you just really happy to see me? She purred, pressing herself back against him and allowing her arms to happily roam over his body, squeezing his wide, broad shoulders and rigid powerful chest. More of a kanabo, he winked cheekily, and she gasped as his hands slid from her hips to cup her rear from behind and squeeze her wagon roughly, a giddy giggle forcing itself from her lips. So you interested or not? He asked. In getting bent over my desk like a common street walker and not the kager I am, or the even more absurd offer of eternal youth? She slid her own hands down to return the favor and grabbed at his own backside. Oh my, how firm. Like marble. An appreciative noise left her lips. Yes. Daiki's smirk widened. So cheeky. May squeezed his behind and sked, before letting her intrusive thoughts win and leaning up to sloppily press a kiss again the side of his jaw. She wanted to lick every inch of this young, strong, handsome, lustful lad, but would have to settle for this right now. It seems too good to be true. Above all else from what I've learned from you, about the Akatsuki and the strength of your village and of course yourself, I would be a fool not to accept the offer for an alliance. She admitted. She trailed her tongue across the smooth length of his jaw, up to his ear and done something she'd always dreamed of doing with a young, handsome lover to call her own. She took his earlobe between her teeth and nibbled gently. The real question is why you want to sweeten the deal with me personally? She breathed hotly into his ear, a light caressing whisper she'd practiced countless times for just this situation. What is it I can alone have that you want, that you'd offer such a thing? Because assuming what he said was true, and she honestly had no reason to doubt his claims at this point, seeing as he was ready to prove it here and now, then what he was offering was something completely out of this world. Something many would be willing to go to war for and sacrifice millions without blinking an eye in their greed. The only thing you can give me... Daiki pulled back from her lips to stare down into her eyes. Yourself, quite frankly... You alone are worth far more than the Mist Village as a whole. She felt a shudder run down her spine at his words. Damn, what a sweet talker. Or was she just that pathetically weak to a compliment like that? Honestly, she didn't care. Oh, May raised an eyebrow and mentally patted herself on the back that she didn't stutter. Not just in my bed either, he laughed before shrugged. I want your experience and your strength by my side as well. I plan on living a long time as you can no doubt tell by the offer I gave. Having you by my side means not only will I have maybe the most beautiful woman in the world on my arm, but a contender for the strongest backing me up as well and ensuring we win. He pecked her atop the nose and rolled his eyes. Of course an alliance between both our villages is will help increase the prosperity of both and that's a good thing, he pointed out. But here's a secret. I'm greedy and want the best this world has to offer. Power, money, entertainment, and of course women. The Akatsuki and everything else in the end are just bumps in the road. And once they're dealt with, we will have all the time in the world to enjoy ourselves. We will. Not him alone. We, plural. Meaning her as well. Assuming she agreed of course. A thought came to mind. Is that a marriage proposal? May blurted. Before she could stop herself. I'm a bit young to get married. Daiki laughed. But if that's what it takes, then I won't refuse if you accept. His hand moved from her rear and trailed down the length of her thigh and up under the hem of her battle dress, making her gasp. 
I did say all the guys around you are idiots for not trying to get you in a nice lacy white wedding dress. I'll happily put you in one before ripping it off of you. Oh my, he really did mean his words, didn't he? Her heart skipped a beat and she felt her cheeks flush. God, she wanted to just pull his clothes off of that delightfully muscular body and ride him raw right now. So, the Hokage-to-be stared straight into her eyes. How about me and you enter a secret little alliance between only us two for now? There's plenty of benefits to being under me. I thought you wanted me over the desk? May shot back, not even a little bit ashamed at the way her thighs pressed together. But I can definitely see the benefits of being under you as well. You'll definitely be spending a lot of time under me, that's for sure. The boy almost cackled. If it weren't for the fact Anko and your people are outside and waiting for us and would get suspicious if we took too long, I'd take you right here and now. He growled, lifting his hand and running it through her hair almost possessively. She wanted him to grab her by it and drag her off to have his way with her. Alas, her duty as a Kage came first above all else right now. As tempting as his words were, to just throw aside her duties and run off with him, she cared for her people greatly. All right, Daiki Kuen, May relented with a sigh. Putting aside the alliance between our villages, I agree to this little secret alliance between us as well. You'll have to inform me fully what you want, though. He gave her an odd look. I did, though, he pointed out. You. I want you to be one of my women and help me deal with the Akatsuki when the time comes. That's it. She blinked herself. Oh. He was being very literal about everything said. Her heart thundered in her chance. Was this her popular phase, finally? What were those dreaded words that inspired fear in even the seven swordsmen of the mist? Was this the true springtime of her youth? Era era. A giggle escaped her lips and may beamed at the boy. Oh Daiki Kuen, if only we were truly alone right now. You've no idea how happy what you just said makes me. I would really let you bend me over this desk of mine and have your way with me. But we really don't dash. He pressed a finger to her lips and stopped her speaking. Yeah, no chance we can get away with shabowinking right now. Daiki agreed, before his hands found her hips again, and she suddenly found herself lifted, and her rear deposited on her desk. I can definitely give you a decent preview though. She felt chakra flare from his palm. And then a breeze rippled across her body and she looked down and stared, gobsmacked. Her entirely nude body beyond her boots and leg mesh stared back at her as Daiki lowered himself, looming over her. A primal look of pure hunger was directed at her physique. And for the first time in her life, May felt like prey before a predator. Era era. And that concludes this episode. If you enjoyed it, I'd seriously love it if you guys could leave a like on the video as it genuinely helps out so much. And it keeps me going. Plus it takes only one second. That said... Have a wonderful day. See you in the next one.